Hey, what's up? Welcome to Movie Dumpster Season 3, Episode 23. Today we're talking The Dungeon Master from 1984, directed by David Allen, Charles Band, John Carl Beekler, Peter Ford, Peter Manoogian, Ted Nicolau, and Rosemary Turco. I'm Joel Escola. I'm Sean O'Rourke. I'm Connor Heavy Rain McGraw. Welcome to The Dumpster. Now, here is how it will be. I, Mestima, have devised seven challenges. Lose one, just one, and I shall have both your souls. Come on, tell me those glasses are not the most heavy rain looking. <laughs> I, I was, dude. I have never played heavy rain, but I have some thoughts about the glasses. We'll get to them. Yeah, we, we sure will. <laughs> I just wanted to say, uh, Joe, that was a mouthful, and you said that flawlessly. Oh, thank you. That was a single fucking take. <laughs> it was. He's not lying. Not that you would ever know. Yeah, no. <laughs> what you hear is the take. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't foul that one up. That's mostly because I'm so familiar with these people. You want to know why? Be- sure. Because this is like an Empire Pictures greatest hits slammed into one fucking movie. This movie could be like a movie dumpster digest. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of movies do you watch? Just watch Dungeon Master. You'll get everything. It covers all the bases. <laughs> you get a little taste of everybody. Honestly, I feel like John Hurt just teleported into Joe's house when he was a kid and just kind of perused the uh, selection. It was like, all right, I'm going to hire this guy, this guy, this guy, and this guy, and this woman here uh, to make a movie made for Joel Escola. He just doesn't know it yet. He's like Rufus. He comes in the fucking phone booth. Yeah, yeah. Or no, it comes in the projector booth, and he opens the door, and, and it's all these directors are like, come on, we're making a fucking movie. Movie. Get inside! You know, the weird thing is, though, this movie came out in 84, and, you know, Joe wasn't alive yet, so technically it's like a Spaceballs thing where, where it was already on your shelf. Yeah, well, I went back to the future. Yeah. That's what happened. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <gasps> movie dumps to the movie! <laughs> oh, don't, don't, don't be spoiling shit. Uh... There is a synopsis. Anyway. <laughs> uh, he's not lying about that either, folks. We've written it. It's somewhere in the ether. We've workshopped it. Come on, the pieces fit. We've got time travel. We've got, you know. It might be a comic. Stay tuned. Maybe. <laughs> One day. Wink, question mark. Uh, but the Dungeon Master, of course, in the year 2020, how could we avoid doing a movie that is... I was going to say based on Dungeons and Dragons, but I'm going to say just very loosely taking ideas from Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, you know, it's, it's a double crit, guys. 220s. Do you want to know the backstory on that? I would love to hear it. It's very brief. I can tell you my guess. <laughs> What's your guess? My guess is that someone was like, how do I make a movie that will frighten every parent in 1984? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, that that was Monsters and Mazes with Tom Hanks. Yes. That was based on some fucking book by some cop that thought Dungeons and Dragons was driving people insane. Yeah, let's see. <laughs> all right, here's what you do. You put in heavy metal, Dungeons and Dragons. All right, uh, uh, the devil and uh, some skeletons, and you'll frighten everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. If you play the movie backwards, Satan appears at your doorstep. <laughs> Except he's named Esteban. Can you believe it? <laughs> <laughs> Don't turn your computer on. Esteban's coming. Yeah. Computers are the devil. So a so a, a tabletop RPGs. Uh, it's very brief. It's just this t- this movie was originally titled Rage War in Europe. And when it was released in the U.S., they changed it to The Dungeon Master to capitalize on Dungeons & Dragons. But I'm not really sure why. (laughs) Uh, Me either. Neither title is particularly good. (laughs) No. I feel like The Dungeon Master will not, you know... I'm going to get into it in a few minutes of my, where my brain goes with all this. It's not entirely wrong with the context of this film, the way it plays out. Like, I can kind of see it. But Rage War? I don't I don't even get that one at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one's incredibly bizarre. Richard Mole is very mad in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> he, he also could be a dungeon master if he was not also Satan. He's also sexually frustrated, too. You think that's the problem? <laughs> I guess it depends on what kind, how your game goes. I mean, I've heard some stories. There's some piece of shit DMs out there, so maybe? It zooms out and it's just some fucking, gu- like, nerd sitting behind a fucking uh, 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 the, the RPG, and he's like, alright, this is what happens next to Paul. Wow, man, you just shattered my reality. <laughs> 
<laughs> this is what Joe thinks of me. Wow, goddamn. <laughs> The guy playing with Paul was, like, really good at the game and just, like, no sweats all of these fucking scenarios. Oh, oh sure, well, right. Yeah. I mean, honestly, like, I feel like that is what the D&D movie should be, is a bunch of people at the fucking table and then you get sucked in, but uh, they, I don't think that's yet to be made. Critical Role's maybe the closest thing to it. Yeah, I mean, even at the end of Dungeons and Dragons, you get a little bit of that, but it's, like, backwards. I would say the closest you get to it now is Jumanji. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I mean, as bad as Dungeons and Dragons is, it was at least, like... It, it took from the source material in ways that I, I could be like, okay, I see what you were trying to do. You just uh, put it through like a shredder and took a shit on it before you actually released it. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then you buried snails under some rocks and he was brought back to life or something. I, I don't know. Go listen to the episode. I'm not rewatching that movie. I think they were just like, oh, yeah, well, that's stupid. Let's make this instead. <laughs> yeah, and then to bless the film they were done, they had Jeremy Irons scream at it for five minutes. Oh, my God. Um. Also, I wasn't making fun of you, by the way. I know. No, I'm playing it up, Joe. I was doing the Men in Black thing, you know, when it zooms out and, it's the, you know. Oh. <laughs> okay, yeah, 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 yeah. But, like, to your point about uh, someone zooming out and it's a DM, I, I could see Richard Mull in this outfit he has. <laughs> <laughs> uh, minus the makeup, uh, DMing. Uh... It's Shane Van Dyke? That's who it is. Yeah, oh, oh, God, help me. He would be one of the PCs. He'd be the guy who'd play, like, the rogue and would constantly keep robbing all the other players, and then everyone would just be pissed at him the entire game. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. Back to my original point of we had to do a D&D movie in 2020. Yeah. Uh, if you don't know what a double crit is, it's two, you know, you have the 20-sided die, you roll it, you get two 20s, it's, you're fucking somebody up with that roll. I, I originally suggested the second Dungeons & Dragons movie, and Joe and Connor were like, they basically pulled their knives out and held them to my throat and said, we're not doing that shit. <laughs> At least not this year. Just, I just casually just, like, popped a clip into my pistol. and just. You know, I'm going to bring it up when we get to the fifth season. I feel like season five, our fifth anniversary, is going to be a lot of uh, returns to greatness. Hey. <laughs> if you want to look at it that way. Movie Dumpster The Revenge. I like that. Yeah, yeah. You got to wait a year and change to get it. We'll probably totally disregard what I just said by then, but it's... <laughs> Maybe we'll bring it up at the end of the year. So is so movie dumps to revenge will be about all the movies offspring. Oh, I like that that we've murdered or coming to track us in the, on the in the Caribbean to kill us. You know what it would really be? It would be the end of you remember the end of Seinfeld when they go they get arrested and like every character from Seinfeld comes in and talks about how they're horrible people. That <laughs> yeah. will be us, but it'll be all these characters <laughs> coming in to disparage us. The MDU characters. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> This sounds like some Doctor Who bullshit when he gets locked in the Pandorica. I could just see us all like sitting in like separate interrogation like rooms. And you know who's our you know who our lawyer is, right? Louis Tully? Of course! Who else? <laughs> I got my degree at night school. Thanks, Lewis. And then, you know, we have the fourth person. I don't know if it's Matt Curione or Rudy or, or C.B. Smith or Jenna. I don't know. Take the pick, Dave. Uh, <laughs> you know, I got to get my own lawyer. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That was short, but pointless. Yeah. You know, to you know, Tony's not even fucked with him. He doesn't even show up to the court here. He doesn't even bother. He's, like, not wasting his damn time. <laughs> I don't know those guys. Yeah, yeah. Tony's Vankman. He's like, he's like, I have no idea who these people are. They're all crazy. <laughs> and of course, your fiance is the other lawyer that uh, Louis Tully got the paper from. Oh, yeah, the blue thing. The blue thing he got from her. Yeah. The blue thing I got from Julie. <laughs> Speaking of Ghostbusters, don't we have Patreon questions? Oh, you just stole the words out of my mouth. We do have a question from Dustin Elkins. Good old Dusty. But uh, Dustin asks, if each of you were to recast the Ghostbusters... Who would you cast? <sighs> um, I sent this question to the guys yesterday. We all talked about it, said, hey, I got to really think about this. And I didn't think about it at all. <laughs> so if you guys got answers while I ponder. No, me neither. Yeah, the same thing happened. I was like, holy shit, that's a loaded question. Like, that requires thought. And then I completely forgot about it. Well, I mean, my, my initial reaction, of course, is John Belushi, Eddie Murphy, you know, the original script Dan Aykroyd had. That's not fair. That's the that's the originals. <laughs> Um, I don't know, Joe, did you think about this all? You got any ideas? It depends when it takes place. Like, is this sure. being released in the summer of 1984? I think, I, okay, well, it sure is fucking 2016, put it that way. Uh, okay, um... That's an interesting scenario if you're gonna just basically swap that movie out with, you know, whatever idea this is. I'm gonna assume Dustin's talking about the original, not the remake. I mean, he could? Sure. I mean, let, let's shoehorn those characters, Melissa McCarthy and Leslie Jones and all them, into the original movie. I actually wouldn't hate that, to be quite honest it wouldn't be the same at all because it had a script right Sh well and there was a story <laughs> <laughs> right 
right. I'm just saying I feel like they are totally capable of delivering most of those lines. Sure. Very different movie. I'm not trying to say it would be the same. No. I, I, it probably would have been good. No, sure. Um, I think it, it would definitely... Just just a mission, Just imagine Melissa McCarthy just turn into fucking Zool and just... <laughs> Are you a god? And, and Melissa McCarthy just like slips and busts her ass on the ground. You know, because that's her thing. She just falls over like Jimmy Fallon. Stop it. No. She's talking about wontons or something. If Leslie Jones was Gozer. <laughs> I just want to see Leslie Jones as uh, as, as Ernie Hudson. <laughs> if somebody tells you you're a god, you say yes! You motherfucker! <laughs> She's funny. I mean, look. Yeah, no, they're all funny. I they're all funny. That movie took a shit for completely different reasons. But anyway. Yeah. Yeah, it's not the fault of anybody in that movie at all. No. No, no it's not. You don't make a fucking movie that's all ad-libbed. Anyway. I blame Paul Feig. Uh, who would be my picks? Let's just say, I'm, I'm going to go with just like dream, there's only one Ghostbusters movie ever made. Yes, not even two. Not even two, not even the remake, just one Ghostbusters made. I got to got to go. <laughs> Bobby Brown is one of the ghosts. He could be. His kid brother. He wants a Proton Pack, man. You know, I love that album. The uh, soundtrack to Ghostbusters 2 is incredible. If you haven't heard it, you're fucking missing out, by the way. How many times have we listened to that at, <laughs> at work when we work together? Yeah, a lot. We would just fucking crank that shit, doing fucking, like, doing screen printing? Um, just, just to put a pin on that, I think that would be a pretty interesting casting, but also, like, fuck Bobby Brown. Oh, you know, fuck Bobby Brown, dude. Uh, la, 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 la. If I had to, my so my so my dream cast, or not even dream cast, like just like who who I think might be good, I kind of like the idea of somebody like Vince Vaughn being in there. Okay, maybe like the Dan Aykroyd character. I could see that. I could even see him being Venkman because Venkman's very detached and doesn't really give a shit about most of what's happening. I want to say he was actually rumored to be in the remake that was like in development hell for years. Yeah, yeah, and like Vince. Vaughn has that very dry, like, matter of fact, like, this is stupid and it's, I'm above it kind of personality to him that he can pull off. I think he could pull off Bankman or Stans, yeah. personally. I, I th he's my stance. Um, I would pick RDJ for my for my Bankman. God, me oh! too! I the same thing! <laughs> That's a good answer. I mean, he like, could you imagine him in that whole, like, apartment scene with, with Sigourney Weaver? They hate this. You know what I mean? <laughs> no kiss. Like, I would love it. Yes. This man does have no dick. Oh my god, look at all the junk food. Um... <laughs> I'm literally visualizing this, by the way. <laughs> and then I guess I... You know what? I would totally keep Ernie Hudson. I don't want to replace him at all. Sure. He he is underrated in that film. I think Ernie Hudson's underrated in general, to, to be perfectly honest. Great actor. I would just put Idris Elba in there because I love that man. I would watch him do anything. Oh, <laughs> man. Actually, um... I don't know if he's got the comedic timing of Ernie Hudson, but... I, I'm into it. I think he's a little too handsome, if that makes sense. He's a little too handsome, and he's a little too swat. He's a too debonair, right? I think that makes it funnier, because he's like, the, like you're looking at that cast, and you're like, Jesus Christ, Idris Elba, you're such a fucking god man. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I guess you could put him in as Venkman, too. That would be kind of fun. Yeah! I've always wanted to kind of see uh, Jay Baruchel uh, put a proton pack on, and he's the kid. Yeah, that. that would be cool! I have no idea who that is. Jay Baruchel, he was in uh, This Is The End, he was in She's Out Of My League, he, he was in uh, The Sorcerer's Apprentice. He's in Tropic Thunder, he's like the one guy that's not famous. Judd Apatow comedies, he pops up in those. Is that the guy who voices Hiccup in How To Train Your Dragon? Yes. Okay, yeah. He also had his own TV show for a few years with him and Eric Andre, I forget what it was called though. See, I would put him in like... A sequel. Yeah, that's what I said. I'd like to see him put a proton. He could be Lewis Tully. Yeah, I'd like to see him, like, suit up, but I don't know if I would actually- I'M A GHOSTBUSTER! <laughs> So to round, uh, the Egon Egon is probably the hardest for me. Yeah, because and th that's the thing about this question that I, we we kind of haven't addressed yet is like the casting of the original Ghostbusters is so fucking perfect, and that movie is such a mm. is lightning in a bottle in every respect. That like it's an enigma. Even talking about like, hey, find a way to do it again. You're like, what? No, like, <laughs> it's so hard. Well, right. I mean, who do you even? How how do you replace Sigourney Weaver? You know, that's that's tough. That too. Um, and like it's really hard to think about like I don't know even like contemporary or like even maybe people from like 15 years ago or 20 years ago that would fit together that 
fucking well. Right. And pull that off so perfectly that, yeah, it's, it's a loaded question. They also have to have that chemistry, too. And it's yes. just like, I'm trying to think, like, who would who would work well together? David Spade and Chris Farley. Yeah. And, like, modern day examples are, like, the, the SNL people or, like, the MCU cast. But, like, yeah. people who consistently work together that have that rapport where they can just, they just do drop into this kind of, you know, movie scenario and they just work. Oh, yeah. You know, J- Joe said RDJ and, you know, you just mentioned the MCU. You know what would be a fucking hilarious visual? You just have, like, the fucking Avengers, but they have, like, the Ghostbuster gear over their their Avengers costumes. Oh, <laughs> that would be fucking funny. Like, Captain America is stands, but he's got, like, the helmet and the costume on under the Ghostbuster gear eating the Chinese food. Holy shit. Getting his dick sucked by a ghost. Uh, also, Paul F- Paul Rudd fits right in there, dude. Yeah, and so does um, Ruffalo fits in as Egon, too. Like, that's, that's the only one I would pick. Yeah. Exactly where my brain was going, Connor. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, well, Paul Ruddy's gonna be in the new one. Yeah, yeah, he is. <laughs> I- I'm really looking forward to that. I actually totally forgot that was being made until it came out of my mouth. Again, we gotta drink that fucking Ecto Cooler when it drops, dude. Oh my, I, have we ever talked about that on the show? Yeah, we. it's been sitting in my pan. We've already solidified it in the show, but I'm gonna do it again, because we're gonna drink that fucking 2016 fucking <laughs> high C. I can't wait for the bowel movement after that. That's gonna be, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> me either. <laughs> but I'm gonna do it. Um, okay, I'm gonna take this in a slightly different direction, because have you, as you guys have been talking, I've already kind of started to formulate my answer, but, uh, there you go. it's gonna be the MDU version. Sure. <laughs> oh no. You know who's playing Ray? It's fucking Daniel Baldwin. Oh, d- without a doubt. Uh Egon, John Hurt. Okay. Uh Vankman. Uh, who the fuck would play Vankman? That's that might be a little tough one. Oh, uh, actually, I know the answer. I, I thought of it a few minutes ago. Uh, the guy from Robot Jocks, Achilles, because uh, because Sigourney Weaver, Dana Barrett is Athena. Gary Graham. There you go. Yeah. And then Lewis Tully. Uh, I was gonna say John Candy to keep my original joke going with the with the the cast before it was rewritten. With the could you imagine fucking John Candy? Did you ever hear about that? How he wanted to ha- play this character with all these Rottweilers and everything, and Ivan Reitman's like, John, no, that's not the character. And he's like, yeah, but what if we had like I had like three Rottweilers? He's like, no, John. I love you, John, but no. Winston, who the fuck would play him? I'm trying to think, it might just be Ernie Hudson. <laughs> Fuck it. Uh, yeah, right? Ernie Hudson's the only consistency throughout everything. He's the lifeline. It could be Munchie. <laughs> no, Munchie's Slimer. Munchie is absolutely Slimer. Okay, yeah, that disgusting little slob. <laughs> <laughs> and Granny Van Dam is the fucking library ghost. Oh. Yes, yes, that lines up a little too well. That is actually terrifying when I think about it. <laughs> but it's trying to have sex. But, it, like, it's the library ghost, but it's the one that gl- that gives Ray a blowjob. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, it gives uh, D- <laughs> gives Daniel Paul with a blowjob. Come, I'm following you home, son. Fun Ghostbusters confession, the library ghost jump scare fucked me up for years. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, dude. <laughs> That's what was so great, though, but, like, like when we were kids, like, it was so scary, but also funny, and it was like, what the fuck? Yeah, that shit gave me nightmares. I would cover my eyes for, like, a long time watching that movie and then uncover them when that scene was over. The Sedgwick Hotel used to freak me out. Yeah. Because there was no music or any... Well, there's, like, music in a few parts, but when they're fucking actually going after Slimer, it's just, like, him, like, breathing heavily and shit. Yeah, just... You know, <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, you did get John Belushi. He was Slimer. There you go. Well, right, technically... Yeah. Lewis Tully, Clint Howard, come on. <laughs> oh my god, yes. Okay, who the dog? Could you imagine Clint Howard being Lewis Tully? Can I supplement this with a potential Ghostbusters 2 MDU casting? Uh, Janusz would be Alexander. Oh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I was gonna say Zool, but that works too. Yeah, Janusz would be Alexander from Robot Chunks. <laughs> Why my drippings with goo? Venkman, I have already killed you. I was gonna say Gozar, because that's a visual, but I like Janusz, that's a good one. And of course, like, Valtzen would be Vigo. The Vigo in this case. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or or it could just be Vigo. He was in the 13th Warrior. Just keep him in there. It's like visually the same fucking thing. <laughs> it's the same guy. Might as well be. I think we joked about that on the 13th Warrior. We kept calling him Sig Valtzen and Vigo. He's still voiced by Max von Sydow. <laughs> yeah, well, right. well, yeah, obviously. Yeah, and, and the guy from 13th Warrior voices uh, Ulfric in Skyrim. Yes. Oh, man. Yeah, that's right. You said that on that episode. That's funny. I, I like Connor's answer of Jay Burrishell as Lewis Tully, especially with that second uh, movie part, but fucking imagine Clint Howard get the proton pack on. How funny that would be. Oh my god. <laughs> I need that now. Dude. I mean, it, you're not beating Rick Moranis, but it's a great visual. But I want his hair from uh, the end of Evil Speak, like when he comes out like of the fucking fire station. Yes. Okay, side note here. His hair, we didn't do the movie yet, and I haven't watched it yet, but our next film, The Wraith, he has an amazing fucking haircut that would be perfect for this. <laughs> 
What if he was Spangler with the hair at the end? Well, that's that's kind of what I was going to say initially, but John Hurt just slides right in there perfect. Um, Somebody needs to deep fake uh, Clint Howard onto Lewis Tully shooting the fucking slime. Somebody. All, all over the, the, uh, the, the, the museum. Somebody. The art museum. What do you mean someone needs to? Someone probably. Somebody. I'll say it a fourth time. Somebody. Us. We need to do that. I, right. You're right. I do. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, yeah. I guess that's what I should have said. <laughs> if that already hasn't been done. I Who else is coming up with this shit, Connor? Clint Howard as Lewis Tully. I I don't know. There are people in their house who are like, man, what would, uh, what would The Rock look like as Cabal from Mortal Kombat 11? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what, would, what would it be like if Munchie was in A Nightmare on Elm Street? God, that is... It's, still, I was not ready for the when he pops out from behind the fucking... <laughs> The, the the furnace there. It's your brainchild. I just brought it to life. <laughs> but going back to Munchie, if he is Slimer or Onion Head, whichever one you prefer, just imagine him in the Sedgwick Hotel fucking running around, just throwing off one liner after one liner. But that's how he, he would talk people to death. Yeah, I would say it would be hard to find him. Yeah. <laughs> he can't shut the fuck up. Find the source of the annoying thing. You don't even need a PKE meter. Uh, he, you know, he'd be, uh, he'd be going around the chandelier on a pizza. Oh, my God. That's right. Uh, we honestly, Dustin, with with this uh, question, I could probably just keep coming up with answers yeah. for like another hour. But I kind of want to get into the episode. We might we might revisit this topic li- unless you guys have other characters you want to, you know, MDU wise. Um, what are the terror dogs in this universe? Are they different? Or are they just the terror dogs? No, I see. I like the terror dogs. They're fine. I feel like, I, but maybe no, no. The the, the terror the terror dogs are just the cop from Ghostbusters who says there's a bear, there's a pot, but they run in all fours. It's just two of those guys with their with his head. Yeah, they just. Uh, excuse me. It was not a cop that said that. It was the guy who opened the door to the hotel, to the apartment building. Yes, it was the fucking door hop. It's that guy, but they just run it all fours. But speaking of which, they should both be uh, a Fenrir beast um, with cop hats on. With cop hats on. Mm. <laughs> yes, that would be amazing. The terror, the terror ears, the terror, the terror wolves. One, one's Fenrir, and the other one's the monster in the closet. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Wait, monster in the closet is the fucking ghost that pushes a, that pushes itself through that fucking archway. <laughs> In the second movie, the orange one? Maybe. Who is the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man in the MDU? That's also Daniel Baldwin. <laughs> yeah. The mech, the one that I was talking about in Robot Jacks, that's what starts walking down the street? It could be. They, they look around, where's Stans? And he's in a fucking mech. Well, okay, wait a second. <laughs> Who is Stans? I mean, I said Baldwin, but I guess he could just be Stay Puft. I guess that kind of makes more sense. No, 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 I'm saying whoever's playing that has to think of the characters, so you have to, like, get into the head of that character. I, I mean, <laughs> with that said Baldwin's always thinking about himself so that kind of lines up oh god how funny would it be if, if we could fit Alec Baldwin into the role of stance and like <laughs> someone's like think of a destroyer and he thinks of his fucking brother like <laughs> it's Alec or no god forbid it's Steven then we're really in trouble oh no yeah it's just a giant bud uh, bud Doyle from fucking uh from biodome oh god I think it's just like a big like hamburger or like a or a tequila bottle right Anthropomorphic, of course. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it. It's the Sedgwick Hotel guy. A bear in his apartment. What would the Sedgwick Hotel guy be? You know, you know who, who, who Oh, wait a second. I, I fucked that up. That's from Lewis Tully's building. Well, I was going to say the guy from the Sedgwick Hotel. Who was that guy in the last episode? His name was like Ace something? Ace Mask. <laughs> Ace Mask. That's him. That's got to be him. Sure. The guy from Sedgwick who, who was in house. Oh, well, yeah, obviously. That shoots the fucking harpoon at Roger Cobb at William Cat. Yeah. I guess he keeps his job. He gets to stay in there. He's already an MDU character. Yeah, that's true. Uh, where do, where does come dark? Yeah, oh, God, he's Stay Puff. Who am I kidding? There you go. Okay. What yeah, what are we talking about? Yeah, that's that's yeah, Cumdar is definitely stay puffed. And when they fucking blow him up, he just fucking shoots cum all over this New York City. Yes! Exactly! And Peck gets just fucking a, a huge bukake right on him. Covers Malter Peck and cum! <laughs> That fucking writes itself. Like, they shoot him, he explodes in a bunch of white goo that lands on everybody. You, we could probably edit that ourselves. <laughs> is William Atherton still... Does he still have to pay with the cum on him, or does, or does he get recast, too? No, just bring William Atherton back and cover him in cum. Oh, my God. And it's just like, ah, what? He's just walking down the street, and he's not even, like, political or anything anymore. He's not working for the mayor's <laughs> office. He's just minding his own fucking business. He's like, ah, not again. Yeah, he's not even actually, like... Yeah, exactly. I love that. I don't even work for the EPA anymore. What the fuck? You turn him off, we're gonna turn them off for you. Here's some cum. Oh, man. Okay. Again, we could keep talking about this because every answer is hilarious. 
hilarious. <laughs> Literally for a whole episode. This is too deep of a well. Maybe we'll write this idea down for like a mini so down the line. The, the, the movie Dumpster Ghostbusters rewrite that for some reason needs to now happen. Hey man, shit happens sometimes. And who are you going to call? The Dumpster Trio? Probably. Somebody else. Yeah, so <laughs> I gotta ask, is John Hurt well and have you seen him? <laughs> have you seen him lately? <laughs> well, when I was when I was a lad, John Hurt used to spin yarns about a fucking movie dumpster universe, about a fucking car that flies through time and shit. About a spectral giant shark that that came out of the water and ate people. <laughs> they used to rocket past his castle. <laughs> <laughs> yup. I like that we have. Uh, I like that we're we're now into like doomsday clock territory of turning John Hurt into Doctor Manhattan. Like this is how. <laughs> Well, and you know, the funniest part to me, I, I literally already have a damn sore throat and we didn't even talk about the fucking movie really yet. I know. We literally were just joking in the beginning of this episode about the fucking movie dumpster movie, and we just basically did that with Ghostbusters. <laughs> Pretty much. That's part of it, right? It's gotta be, right? Of course. Obviously. Yeah, we're, spo spo we're a bunch of hacks. We just copied from some of their great work and we just slap our own names onto it. Yeah, fuck them. MDU. We hope that uh, answered your question, Dustin. <laughs> <laughs> question mark. If it didn't, I don't know what else you really wanted us to say. Um, we do have one email from, uh, Angie. Angie. They say, your show is hilarious. You should review Stepfather 2 and Amityville, The Evil Escapes. Well, thanks, Angie. The Amityville, The Evil Escapes is is the one with the lamp? I've never seen that one. I think? I've only seen the first two. I kind of stopped after two. Well, 3D is... is fine i've i've seen the remake of the first two well there you go so 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 you we, we that solidified now so season five is going to be the revenge of the mdu and let's do stepfathers we have another stepfather's day yeah well stepfather's day was stepfather's day too there you go and that's part of that pantheon the other good one i'm excited for that one because it's like the first one except slapstick as fuck <laughs> <laughs> and it totally works. Um, like I was saying on that episode, it's just, it's just a different kind of movie than the first film, you know? Sure. Also, it's like going from Winter Soldier to Civil War. Like, the thing just develops. Well, yeah, that too. Spider-Man is in it, ironically. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, Spider-Man is in Stepfather too, everybody. He's like, hey, hey, what are you doing? That's a hell of an arm you got there. Hi, hey, hey, everybody. You know, it's his new Uncle Ben. <laughs> That's a new Uncle Ben. Well, it's Terry O'Quinn. It's Jerry. It's Jonathan Brandis. Hi, Peter. I brought you a new Uncle Ben. Oh, my God. He sees the red book. He's like, oh, no. Crookshank fucking ducks out the back. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I forgot about that. I've done it again. <laughs> See you later. Gage, my friend. Honestly, it's kind of hilarious just that that somehow works out perfectly <laughs> that Terry O'Quinn is there with the Winter Step Soldier project. You know, I'm sure Steve told him all about it. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. But yes, thank you, Angie, for writing in. And uh, thank you, Dustin, for writing in. We appreciate it. So, on to the movie at hand. So, yeah, so we're talking about the Dungeon Master. So, yeah, we got seven directors for this film. Yeah. And they're all of the Empire Pictures Full Moon camp. Particularly, we've, we've talked about a few of these guys already. And guys, we've talked about a few of these people already. Uh, David Allen, of course, is the stop motion uh, extraordinaire. Uh, we got Charles Band, obviously, the producer, uh, the, the mastermind behind uh, Empire Pictures and Lightning Video and Wizard Video and, and uh, Full Moon and all of that. Uh, then we have John Carl Beekler, another special effects maestro uh, who's, who's done so much great work over the years. Huge inspiration for me as a kid. Uh, Peter Ford, who has only directed this little segment in this film and literally nothing else. Peter Manugian is doing a segment in this as well, and um, he's coming back to, back to the show because we he's the director of Demonic Toys. Yes! Oh, shit. Yeah, and Eliminators and The Seed People and a couple other Full Moon and Empire Pictures uh, films. Uh, we got Ted Nicolau in here, too, the fucking man behind Subspecies and and Terror Vision and Dra uh, Dragon World. Yes! Yeah. Terror Vision might, uh, you know, keep that in the back of your mind, guys. Maybe for next year, maybe. Fuck yeah. Oh, dude, I'm 100% I'm in on that. Also, there, we're going to get into a little bit of Terror Vision later. It's all for you, Serge. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have uh, Rosemary Turco, who uh, directs one of the segments in this film. Uh, we got music by Richard Band, and he's bringing the goods. I mean, this is Richard Brand, like, in his prime, and... It's fucking great. Um, he's also joined by Shirley Walker on the film score. And again, like I said, special effects by uh, John Carl Beekler and David Allen in this film. So they're doing, and and John Beekler's shop is doing all of the uh, practical effects while David Allen is doing stop motion and other visual effects. And there's just one quick aside. So a sequel was shot for this 
in 88 and it was never released now shot it was shot and edited and it was never released what the fuck the only thing i can think of is that after robot jocks was completed and released that was right when empire pictures went under so i guess it took the dungeon master 2 with it uh that sucks i wonder what that was i know i mean I, I don't think that's really an excuse for it what was the year on that do you know dungeon master 2 was shot in 88 it was supposed to be released in 88 and it was shot and edited but it wasn't finished so like i would assume like special effects visual effects all that kind of shit score wow that could have been interesting because i could imagine that was probably more based on D D at that point right R I, you would think i mean i don't know it, there's no really there's not really any details on it that i could find personally i took you to finish that at any point in the last 15 years would probably be difficult. Well, I also thought about it too because they tried to get one of David Allen's films finished and that's like it, it, the, the Primordials or the Primevals, excuse me, um, and they had a Kickstarter for it and everything because um, David Allen had passed away and they had this unfinished film. Now, I could do a whole episode on unfinished Empire Pictures slash Full Moon uh, flicks, but that in particular was one that had a Kickstarter for it, and I'm not sure if it met its goal or not, but I was I was, uh, I was was a supporter of it, so I don't know if it came out or not. I don't, I don't think it met its goal, but I guess what I'm saying is that that should be something that maybe Charlie should like look into like if you got to fucking finish it like I'm sure there's people that want to lend their time to the film or somebody who would support it to get it released right yeah you would think I mean just out of more of a curiosity but maybe the money's not there or they don't think it's worth it maybe I guess maybe it sucks <laughs> maybe it's maybe it sucks even for Charles Band and that's saying something <laughs> I don't know, dude. Have you seen the fucking full moon in the past fucking 10, 15 years? We've talked about it. Are you saying it's Charles Band's uh, The Day the Clown Cried? <laughs> like, uh, fucking <laughs> Evil Bong 20. Ah, eh, just take some footage from Evil Bong and just lay it over everything. Fucking shoot me in the head, would you? The the heyday is, is, far, is far over. On that note, too, there's... There's only a couple differences between... So I mentioned that this was titled uh, Rage War in Europe. Um, there's only one big difference in between the U.S. and, and the uh, international cut. And that's like a whole dream sequence that's been excised from the uh, the home video release of this uh, in the U.S. And it's basically like a scene with Paul in bed with like wires hooked up to him. And he follows Gwen into like through a prison... And um, they hit this crack in the wall and, like, walk through, and then, like, these monsters come in and, like, knock him out and take Gwen. It really, it has nothing to do <laughs> with the fucking movie, so that's why I was probably like, they were probably like, yeah, hey, take it out, fuck this shit. Now it's Rage War. Now it's, now it's Dungeon Master. With this edit, I dub the Rage War. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we've talked about that on the show before, where, like, different versions of films bought by different companies will have, like, weird edits. Like, The Willies is one that we really went into on that. Yeah. Weird edits in different titles. Yeah, but I, I feel like this has kept in the same uh, ownership, so that that's a little strange. You know what I mean? Willies bounced all over the place. Yeah, yeah, that's true. You know what's funny about the, the movies of different names is that, uh, to this day, I keep calling, uh, like, I'm probably gonna get it wrong now, uh, what, Death Walks at Night, He Walks at Night. I keep saying different titles of that movie every time it comes up. Wait, The Night Andy Came Home? Yes. Yeah, Death Dream? That, like, I, everyone's like, yeah, what was that? I'm like, yeah, it's The Night Andy Came Home, or He Walked, or Death Walked, or whatever. I it could, Because we ran off, what, I have, like, four different titles? The night, the original title is The Night Walk. Yeah. And then there's uh, The Night Andy Came Home, Death Dream, and then... Um, nothing Matters, obviously. And that, <laughs> and Nothing Matters, yeah. <laughs> Loomis is in the bushes, something about some six bullet casings. We're not really sure. Check out that Movie Dumpster YouTube and Instagram. Yeah, yeah. if you haven't seen the Nothing Matters video and you listen to the show, you are sorely missing out. Props to Joe on that one. It's fucking hilarious. Thank you. So I will be the first to admit that I am not the expert on the old D&D &D stuff, but... I, I know a little bit. My, my buddy, uh, Chris Cruz, who I've brought up every once in a while on the show, who I play D&D with, he, he's got this shit memorized. Sometimes he just starts rattling this stuff off, and I'm like, huh, oh, yeah, 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 hey, D&D, yeah, right, yeah, awesome. <laughs> uh, yeah, are we going to just play 5e, right? <laughs> and then uh, that that's that. <laughs> But uh, I specifically just want to talk about, like, what edition was out at the time, because the history of D&D is kind of weird, where when it first came out, like, in the 70s, you know, Gary Gygax's company, TSR, you know, they would just keep putting out different versions, but they never really upgraded or changed, I guess. I, I'm not sure what the right word is, to a new edition. So he, here's, like, the breakdown of that for those interested. So you had a 1974 
the original Dungeons and Dragons was released, and all that included was I the Men and Magic book, Monsters and Treasure, the Underworld and Wilderness Adventures, and uh, you know, pretty much you didn't have a whole lot to play with. They gave you like some basic rules. Um, I don't even think they had a twenty sided die at that point, or if they did, there were a few die that that today we use in playing Dungeons and Dragons that didn't exist yet. And you know, I'm sure if I'm wrong about any of this, let me know. Uh, I'd love to uh, be corrected on this, and I'm not, I'm, I'm being totally honest here. If I'm wrong about this, I really would like to know. But in 1977, we got the Blue Book, basic D&D, you know, AD&D would be Advanced Dungeons and Dragons is the shorthand for that. In 1981, we got the Red Book, which included, like, some more stuff, or, or the Magenta Book, excuse me. The Red Book came in 83, and that's the one I think that this movie, had I not known that it was just renamed... <laughs> would be cribbing on that's the thing like it was just to cash in on it so i guess that red book was super big that year um uh yeah as far as i know again i mean right up front i'm not the total expert on this but my understanding is that's when it really started to pop off sure because you didn't even get second edition until 89 yeah and that's where they started introducing a lot more stuff and then eventually like in 97 you know, granted, that's 20 years into the company. They got bought out by Wizards of the Coast. Mm. But it was like, you know, again, there's people, you know, you can go online, you can buy all these books. My, my buddy Chris has them all. They're, they're awesome. Look, there's uh, a few books you can buy that break all this shit down. But I'm not going to go any deeper than that because, again, if this movie was literally made because of Dungeons and Dragons, <laughs> I, I think I'd get a little bit more in the nitty gritty. But when you watch this movie, other than a few scenes... Um, that I could say, ah, oh yeah, that's very D and D ish, or or ah, that's very fantasy tropey. It's not really there, right? Which I did, I was, I honestly wasn't anticipating. Because of course, my favorite Dungeons and Dragons campaign is the Mad Max Nuclear Wasteland campaign. <laughs> 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 hey, it's my, mine too. With the death cars. Right, or the trip to fucking Los Angeles in 1990. Yeah, or, <laughs> yeah, or the, the, the serial killer campaign. The cyberpunk fucking uh, side venture. My favorite one is the trick-or-treat uh, version where you go to the rock concert. <laughs> but it kind of it kind of lines up, though, at least according to like something like uh, Stranger Things, where like well, it, that takes place right in that pocket. Of, like, 84. Right, exactly. Obviously, Stranger Things, straight up, they're playing D&D. Yeah, like, straight up. Uh, the original version, and this, it's kind of like, like, to Joe's point earlier, yeah, very clearly a cash-in. Well, especially on the name for the marketing, you know what I mean? Sure. They fooled you. They fooled me, and the movie's been out for 26 years. Oh, excuse me, 36 years. What the, God, oh, wow. Oh, Jesus. What's even more misleading is the is the actual cover for the VHS. <laughs> the, the cover for this movie is bonkers. The cover for this movie, the U.S., Lightning video release on VHS has this giant picture of Blackly, Blackie Lawless on it from from Wasp, the lead singer of Wasp. What? Yeah. I mean, he he is in it. Oh wait a minute! I, I saw. I must have seen the the poster for like the the market release because like what I saw was like this purple and black like awesome fucking metal album cover looking shit. Yes, that's the one with like Richard Mole's face on it. Yes. Well, right. And I, I was talking to Arlen about this, Arlen Haro, uh, friend of the show. Yeah. He was like, ah, oh, it looks like a Zardoz poster. Yes, it does. Um, yeah, like I said, like the Lightning Video uh, VHS release, the, that poster has just like a giant face of Blackie Lawless. And then like the main protagonist, uh, Paul and, and Richard Mull, the, the main antagonist, are just like way smaller, like on the bottom of the cover. <laughs> How weird. It's so fucking weird. Wasp is in one scene that lasts for like maybe four minutes. We are going to get to Wasp and their history with Empire Pictures when we get there. But by the way, that blew my fucking mind. I, I'm not trying to downplay that. Yeah, <laughs> good, because I don't know anything about this band, so. Oh, yeah, they're just, they're a metal band from the 80s. Yeah. But they, they're featured prominently in Empire uh, stuff. So I, I guess that's all I really got to say about D&D at the moment. If if things come up as, as we talk about them, I'll expand on that, but. Uh, yeah, totally. I really was under the assumption that this movie had more to do with D&D going into it. Oh, for sure, because, it, it, yeah, it definitely brands itself that way. Connor, you want to fucking give uh, plot crunch? A very, very bored Beelzebub <laughs> decides he's going to just, like, fuck with an extremely competent, athletic, smart, witty, handsome guy who's far superior to him in every way. Yeah! <laughs> and he's like, hey, let's do some challenges, and this guy's like, all right, and he beats his ass every time. Yeah! <laughs> 
doesn't even sweat for most of it. Seemingly with a hand tied behind his back, right? Yeah, like, it's just a, like that Satan himself is like, yeah, seven challenges. Nyeh. And Paul, like, like one, he's like, step over this line. And Paul's like, done. He's like, damn you. <laughs> I want to know if this was before or after he lost that violin or that, uh, that fiddle contest. <laughs> You gotta ask Charlie Daniels on that one. <laughs> you think that that demoralizes him? And he just hides out in this fucking dark space where he's like, "Find me an attractive Brad Pitt-looking man, and I will challenge him to a battle of wits." Well, this is what fucking this is what Esteban did, man. He like this is like what he's doing while he waits for somebody to boot up the computer again. Yeah. He's like, "I'm bored. I'm going to fucking bring mortals in that are worthy adversaries?" Question mark. So I can fuck with them. Find me a Silicon Valley hunk with glasses he can talk to. Get me those Google Glass. <laughs> By the way, uh, th this what is this character? Mestima is this character's name? The devil in this movie? Mestima. Esteban, I mean. He is, like, one of my new favorite characters in this entire show's history. Like, he is, he amuses the fuck out of me. Well, you know, Richard Mull, he's got a history in the MDU. He has many faces. He just abducts this guy, and he's like, I have your wife. C can finish these challenges, and I'll transport you to variously video gamey themes. <laughs> I mean, honestly, talking about Dungeons and Dragons, I feel like Richard Mole has the fat has the mask of many faces. Like he just puts that thing on and just fucking transforms. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, but it's still very clearly Richard Mole. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Every time he thinks he's really like uh, hiding his features, but he really just has a different costume on. Like in the monster, there's a monsters episode with him and Eddie Deason. Um. Oh my god. Uh, of course there is. The name is escaping me at the moment, but like it's this lawyer guy who like summons these demons to like give him money. And he summons Eddie Deason, and then Eddie Deason is summoned by Richard Mull. But Richard Mull and Eddie Deason are in fucking demon makeup. I gotta look this up now. It's fucking great. <sighs> Paul has John Hurt's technology. I'm just gonna say it first before you guys get a chance. <laughs> I, I like how, like, this movie, because here's the thing, I was really confused, because I went in this really blind, so, when you're like, Dungeon Master, I'm like, okay, this sounds like a Deathstalker kind of movie, like, one of those, where it's like, sure. it's like a, you know, a shoestring budget sword and sando movie or something like that, where it's like, the wizard has the thing and we must blah blah. Right! Right, me too, Connor. And then, like, this opens up with, this opens up with, like, Steve Jobs talking to his fucking computer, <laughs> and then he, like, puts on his jogging shorts and runs to work. I'm like, what movie is this? <laughs> you gotta run, Connor. You got, you know, it's good for you. Not knowing this would come up later in the, in the movie. <laughs> so I didn't even put that together, <laughs> but yeah. 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 <laughs> I couldn't believe that! <laughs> So this movie opens up at Cyrax. Whoa. Or not Cyrax. Not, don't confuse it with the Mortal Kombat character. They're competing uh, rival company Sector. Yeah. Yeah, to get into the building, you have to enter a green net. Yeah. And down the down the street, David Gale's making Sinjinor. Yeah. No, yeah. So like Connor said, uh, we're introduced to Jeffrey Bryan, who plays Paul Bradford, and he works for the Cyrex company. And 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 also, like Connor said, he's yes, he's he's like this cutting edge technology guy. He's kind of like the Steve Jobs, like know it all dude, super um, into. Um, computers and and making AI and or uh, devices that help us. I mean, this man has Siri in this movie. He has Google Glass in this movie. Oh, he's got fucking Edith from Spider-Man: Far From Home. Okay, he has baby. What are you? Yeah. Am I the only one <laughs> that's making these connections? <laughs> he know he well he has he has her mainframe anyway. He's got that fucking power glove. Well, he you, mm, you know he took he took Professor Screw Eye the screw out of baby, and this is what he got. Cal. He restored her? Cal, uh, what is it? Uh, Excalibur? Excalibur, apparently. Excalibur. He has these motherfucking, you know, Google Glass, whatever you want to call them, these glasses that are just like m magic items, let me tell you. Oh, it's fucking glorious. So, uh, he's talking to his boss, and his boss is like, hey, you work too much. Why don't, hey, I, I love what you're doing, but why don't you hit the fucking road? And he's like, okay, see ya. And then we have this weird exchange outside where he, like, meets his coworker. <laughs> and... This guy's like, I'm dead fucking tired. I'm I'm going I'm going home. I'm sitting on my fuck. I sit on my ass. I watch television. You know, he goes. He does the Charnetsky fucking ritual. Leaves one chair, and moves to another. And uh, Paul is like, Well, I'm gonna go run a fucking mile in my in my little short shorts. Yeah. Yeah. And then the uh, the uh, the 80s synth score kicks on. Oh. Uh, and that's when I was like, No. Amp up the 80s. I'm not feeling it enough yet. Come on, hit me with more. <laughs> well, you know, he's got to sync his watch with, uh, I don't even know what, his fucking computer, I guess? Yeah, he's like, he like sets it and he, he's like, Excalibrate, uh, play Dungeon Master soundtrack. <laughs> right. Well, 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 then we're just like ejected from this scene to like a jazzercising, uh, 
uh, routine of some kind? You can sign me up for all of these 80s workout scenes? Yeah. Okay. Straight up. Put my name on that list. I mean, I get it. I mean, that's what, that's what was in at the time. We're introduced to Gwen here. Um, we don't get a name, but this is, you know, that's who she is. Right. It, it makes sense a few more minutes later, but at first I'm just like, w- w- what is happening? Why is this? Why are we being transported to a dance studio right now? It was an 80s movie, and then, like, when that happened, I'm like, oh, yeah, no, it's an 80s movie, so here we are. And I'm right at home. Yeah. No, I mean, I am. I'm, I'm not saying I'm not. But I was confused. I, I They're health nuts, which is weird. They, like, make that point to be like, yeah, they all, they both work out, and they're very smart and intelligent and uh, athletic. Hey, I told you to get some swordfish. You came home with a whole bag of groceries. <laughs> <laughs> they're both very successful. It's very strange. Dude, this guy has the technology in these glasses that Christopher Lloyd wanted in fucking Suburban Commando to get these lights changed. <laughs> He's fucking Tony Stark, dude. Yes. He is, because he's running down the street. He doesn't stop at the stop sign. He looks up at the fucking light, you know, and he and he hits like a button on his glasses and the light change. How the fuck is this guy not causing accident after accident? <laughs> <laughs> he's running down the street and you just see all the cars collide into each other. Yeah, and I make the Christopher Lloyd reference. If, if people at home have not seen Suburban Commando, again... For the uninitiated, the lost movie dumpster episode. Yes. There's this whole bit in that movie where Christopher Lloyd is constantly getting stuck at this one traffic light. And at the end of the movie, he gets like a ray gun from Hulk Hogan. I don't know why he's allowed to keep it. <laughs> then he shoots the str- he shoots the light and he smiles and, it, and the movie ends freeze framed on that. He would have loved these glasses. <laughs> why does Hulk Hogan have that particular tool like at his disposal? Oh, God. That... We're going to revisit it one day, and we'll talk about it, but... Yeah. Why he leaves it to Christopher Lloyd is beyond me. Well, he's Hulk Hogan. He's a fucking thundering dumbass. Like, Well, right. Well, yeah. He also, like, caused him all that fucking pain from, like, staying with him at his house, so... Here he goes. Here's a ray gun. <laughs> well, you're welcome. Yeah, he was frozen that day. Yeah. <laughs> This, this is the episode of callbacks and, uh, and, and teases, I guess. Not that every episode isn't. Oh, yeah. And also, this movie was like an hour and 15 minutes long, so. Sure. <laughs> yeah, that too. I'm sure the episode will be longer. <laughs> oh, it's gonna be. So, uh, so yeah, he like, he, like, runs up to this woman that's, like, selling flowers, and he's like, it's like, doodle doo 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 I'm, I got no money in my wallet. Oh, let me go to the ATM. Hang on a second. And he fucking presses his glasses. He, like, looks around. <laughs> And make sure nobody's watching him. And, like, fucking presses his glasses and it automatically tells the ATM to dispense $20 from his account without having to touch the fucking thing. Yeah. How much time are you saving, pal? I mean, I guess maybe he was afraid he was going to get COVID. He didn't want to touch the keypad. Um, my thought is, like, if these glasses fall into the wrong hands, we're going to be doing it for some nefarious shit, dude. Well, like I said, if John Hurt did not create this technology, he's definitely going to try to steal it. No, Steve Steve Jobs did. What if he already did, and that's how he developed his fucking super weapon? <laughs> oh. Right, this is before uh, Frankenstein Unbound? This is before Frankenstein Unbound. No, it's after, but he went back in time to steal it from him, steal it from himself. Oh, my God, he is so Professor Zoom at this point. It's not even funny. Like, he's just <laughs> running all the time. He is, uh, you know, time is uh, but a window for John Hurt. <laughs> it's only a matter of time before he uh, forms the uh, the Legion of Zoom. <laughs> oh, my God. That's a real thing, by the way. I think he already has. Well, uh, you know, again, Comdar, Corpse Fucker, Baldwin. <laughs> Michael Clark Duncan. He's, he's He's got some people. GVD. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, then we go to his apartment and, like, we're introduced to his com- his computer formally now who's the ex-calibrate, and she talks to him and shit, and she's like, you're so handsome today, Paul. How was your day? How's everything? He's like, I'm I'm pretty good. Stop trying to seduce me, computer. Do you think the director of Her saw this film? Uh, Possibly. (laughs) I was like, I can make an entire feature film out of that one scene. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) At that one moment. Make this computer sound like Scarlett Johansson. Okay, perfect. I mean, you get me that way. It, like, tells him some shit. It's like, like, uh, just by by the way, Paul, uh, your your account is overdrawn. He's like, yeah, yeah, I know. I'll, I'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. I have these special glasses. I could have literally told it to take the money out of anybody's account, but I just overdrew myself. Exactly. And you're telling me this, like, super, like, rich, like, inventor guy doesn't have, like, a wad of hundreds in his fucking wallet? Give me a break. Well, (laughs) okay. (laughs) Gwen comes home with the groceries. Played by Leslie Wing, by the way. Right. She makes some kind of... She hates the computer because he's so obsessed with it. (laughs) But she makes some kind of comment like, oh, yeah, I knew you went through all those experiments when you were younger so that you can be unified with the computer. 
and it's never touched on again. No. And I'm sitting there like, wait, 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 go go back a second. What did you just say? Oh. Is this made a fucking super soldier? I don't know, but maybe that dream sequence makes sense now because he's like lying in this bed hooked up to all these like wires and shit. He got linked up, man. Maybe. Yeah, he, he got fucking Job, like proto Job. <laughs> He got something. Yeah. I, I I don't know. Maybe there was something more to that. Maybe that was where the rage war came in. Sure, yeah. <laughs> he took those drugs. Yeah. This guy was Dr. Angelo's college buddy. Right, yeah. Yeah, it was Dr. Angelo's buddy who he took the fucking rage drugs. That made him, like, smart, but also crazy. He was the one uh, experiment for Vimaville that actually was successful. <laughs> <laughs> they just can't find him. Yeah. Open your mind, Paul. <laughs> He's like, I, I gotta take these tablets every day, I'll just melt. And Gwen's like, ah! Oh, Jesus. My dick will explode, I need to take this pill. It, there's like a whole back and forth with them here, and it's like, you know, she's she's like, oh, uh, you know, you, you're really sweet, I bought you all this stuff for, for your fridge, because I knew you were out of shit. And he's like, he's like, oh my god, Gwen, he's like, let's get married, let's do it. And she's like, oh, I, I don't know, I mean, maybe. And he's like, the computer said it was really good for us to get married. <laughs> She's like, a what? Yeah, the algorithm says it's fine. And she basically tells them, like, to go fuck off about the computer. And then we get, like, a scene later in the night where they're, like, sitting down having wine. And he, like, brings up the computer again. He's like, no, wait, come on, Gwen, come over. Like, listen to this. Yeah. He's like, am I a great match for hardworking women that are beautiful and have a hard head? And she's like, oh, that's kind of a fucked up thing to say. And the computer's like, 100% match. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, you know what? I'll be in the bedroom. That's the one place I'll nail you'll have I'll have your full attention. So okay, so you're pissed at this guy, but you're still gonna fuck him? Until he fucking hooks up the, the, the fucking fleshlight to this thing. Uh, I like how he should have been like like, oh yeah, well the computer thinks I'm handsome. <laughs> It's like Chris Lilly in his vacuum. Ugh. I mean, you know, with the fleshlight and the computer, I mean, how else do you think he builds up stamina? Holy shit. <laughs> this is movie dumpster, guys. Let's, lest we forget. I know. And, like, Paul is just like, yeah, and Cal helped me pick out this ring, and, and Cal said we should procreate, and Cal said we should move in together. And she's like, you know what? Fuck you. She's like, I want to be a part of your life. And he's like, you, you, you will be. I mean, you are. Yeah, this guy's a putz. And he's like, look. Cal told you already that we're perfect. Don't you believe the machine? Trust it. <laughs> For me, he's a giant nerd. Like, he's about to prove himself to be, like, the most capable human being on Earth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, not, you know, not that the two are exclusive to each other, but yeah. no. you're absolutely right. So, after a night of passionate lovemaking, question mark. <laughs> question fucking mark. She wakes up and then it's her still skin. <laughs> It's Richard Mole in the bed yeah. next to him. <laughs> oh my god, that would have been a double take. Hi, Paul. His Google Glass freaks out and like f like flares up with this fucking like green smoke. Oh, it's a green flame, man. That's a D and D reference. Is it really? Well, if not, it's definitely a Penny Arcade reference for those that give a shit. Link them up together. This is the MDU here. Everything goes. That's where I'm going with it. So we're thrust into this dream sequence. Uh, he's like in the, in this weird costume and he's like looking for Gwen, and she's, like, bathing in, like, this... Waterfall, basically. Yeah, waterfall, and he's, like, banging on this stone, and he's, like, burning alive at the same time. Yeah. I guess he didn't take his pill, you know? Yeah, well, maybe that's it. He's fucking freaking out, right? Step one, hallucination. First phase is hallucinogenic. His fucking face started melting. <laughs> what was the actual ending of this film? Was that he is actually just dead in the bed in a, in a fucking puddle? He's just fucking flatlined goo. Then he wakes up, and then it's like a dream within a dream, because... His fucking whole house is fogged out, and he gets up and, like, walks into the other room, and he's in this arena, and, uh, he's in his PJs, and his, and, and Gwen is, like, chained to this fucking rock in her underwear, and then, um, and then, yeah, Richard, Richard Mole appears. Well, he, well, he gets zapped there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and then Richard Mole shows up, and the return of the fucking clothes beam. <laughs> yeah! You're, oh my, I didn't even think of that. He fucking turns and he shoots Gwen with a laser and suddenly she's in like <laughs> fantasy d distress garb. Like, yeah. And then we dress Paul like he's from fucking uh, Megaforce or some shit. I don't even know what. Yeah. Paul's costume looks like an unfinished Power Ranger suit. Like, it looks like, like <laughs> halfway through they're like, no, fuck it, it's fine this way. Well, you know, it's this Rage War uniform, obviously. Yes, yes. Can you point where the Rage War is? I'm dressed for the occasion. Excuse me. Is this the set for Eliminators? And uh... <laughs> Richard Mole's character was like, "You're both not dressed for the occasion." Blah, like here, yeah, magic shit. Uh, so yeah, Richard Mole's playing Mestima. They're also like in this like plane of fire kind of area. It's like they're at the bottom of a volcano. It's like the ground is on fire and shit. I get some serious like uh, Denethor vibes from <laughs> from Richard Mole's look in this movie. Yeah, no, yeah. So basically, he's like Richard Mole's whole thing is like. 
ah, you know, I'm I'm the greatest satanic devil magic man that ever lived, and uh, you seem to be a worthy opponent because you got magic machines and you got really good uh, good uh, new magic there. And then Paul's like, "What?" He's like, "So then, like you know, like Connor said, like uh, uh, Richard Mole like zaps him and like puts a suit on him, but then like also equips him with." Excalibrate computer like on his wrist. He equips him with the fucking Mass Effect Omni tool. Okay, this thing does <laughs> whatever the fuck Paul wants it to, whenever he wants it to do it. Yeah, dude, he's playing. He's playing with power now. He's got that glove. He's got that NES glove. Take your fucking pick, right? Richard Mall's basically like, "Oh, your magic I've never encountered before." And Paul's like, "Uh, it's not magic, actually. It's science because stuff." And he's like, "Shut up! I don't want to hear about it." The Earth is flat, too. Don't tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I said so. I. I looked at him on Google, you can't prove me wrong. <laughs> and Paul goes to, like, Cal, because, you know, it's all verbal. Yeah. He's like, oh, yeah, what does Mashima mean? And she's like, ah, oh, it just happens to mean Bazia Bazabble Bub. And, and he's like, huh, okay. Uh, so Satan. Oh, the devil, huh? No big deal. Uh, literally Satan, all right. Yeah, because uh, Richard Mole, like, comes down, he's like, with his giant fucking Esteban sword, and he's like, I, with the powers of darkness, <laughs> I knight you, Excalibrate. And he's like, uh, Excalibrate? And he's like, yeah, that's, that's your name now for the game that we're gonna play. All seven levels. Like, you know, seven levels of hell? Get it? It's Dante's Inferno. It's also a video game. This will never happen in real life. You ever play Donkey Kong Country? <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> in the first impressions of Richard Mole's character, like, uh, Mistima, is that he wants to challenge Paul because he sees him as a worthy opponent. And he's like... And he's the quote-unquote keeper of the new magic. Right. Which I guess is technology. Yeah. And so he basically gives an ultimatum. He's like, he's like, you're going to play my fucking games or I'm going to take your soul. So you'll pick. And, and if he loses once, he's done. Do you think that's what happened to Steve Jobs? Like he lost to Mistima? <laughs> he didn't roll off that cliff, dude. God almighty. Wow. That's the, it wasn't cancer that killed him. It was Richard Mole. No, it wasn't cancer. It was it was Mistima. I mean, I guess it was a cancer, but not not the one we thought it did, it was. And, and that's why Apple has basically done everything that Steve Jobs said he never wanted them to do with the iPhone. <laughs> that was his punishment. It's now controlled by Satan. Yeah. Right, well, Richard Mull, specifically, he can be Satan. Right. Excuse me, Mistima TM. Now I am the master of the new magic. I'm the dungeon master TM now. I own the iPhone now. Do you think Richard Mull's upset that, uh, you know, Gunnar Henson stole his identity a few times? Do you think he's, do you think he's miffed about that? Well, I, I think that's the thing, like, did he steal Gunnar Henson's? Well, right, yeah. Which side was it really to blame? Yeah, did he steal Gunnar Hansen's uh, identity? I mean, who knows? Are there really three Jokers? There could be. I mean, there's a few, but definitely not you, Jared Leto. <laughs> <laughs> no. Literally, Mike Matei from the Angry Video Game Nerd did it better. <laughs> Sure did. God, that was a great episode, by the way, if anybody from Cinemasker is listening. <laughs> I still think about it daily. I went to a Halloween party there, and he, he came dressed as that Joker. It was fucking hilarious. Oh, my God. Yeah, it was great. What a great episode. So he's like, he's like, okay, you're going to play my games. And he's like, and he's like, Paul like gets all tough for a second. He's like, all right, man, I'll play your games. And he's like, you didn't have a fucking choice, Zap. And he fucking shoots him into like Eternia or some shit. Yeah. Well, what would he say if he was like, nah, I'm good. He'd be like, I guess you just forfeit. Fit, you're dead. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't asking. Please go fight. Yeah, you don't have a choice, dumbass. Go now. I'm the literal devil. Are you going to tell me no? Does Paul ever pinch himself, by the way? I don't think so. J just just to see. Dude, Paul is like, if you spilled ketchup on the floor, Paul would slide across it effortlessly just to get to where he has to go at this point. Like, I know. I don't think he can fuck up. Like, he... Yeah, yeah. And he'd, and he'd do it flawlessly. Yeah, like he just he gets dropped into like, oh, wager with the devil. All right, cool, whatever. Just like rolls his shoulder. Just like, yeah, let's do it. Like, <laughs> so... This is it. This film is not an anthology. It is a full, complete story, right? That kind of plays out in quote unquote levels, like each game that he plays. But each level or segment, however you want to call it, whenever he gets zapped to a different place um, for the next game, is directed by a different person. So this first one, where where Paul gets zapped into, is uh, the first story, which is, or the first level, whatever the fuck you want to call it, uh, is Stone Canyon Giant, directed by David Allen. Yeah, and they're all they're all different genres, too. Yeah. Like, right away, you're like, this is weird sword and sandal fantasy uh, territory. This is Jason the Argonauts, this is, you know, Sinbad, this is whatever. Sure. This is definitely one of the ones where 
where I was like, okay, yeah, I could see the D&D connection here. Uh, since you have literally uh, creatures that I, I could see in a D&D campaign uh, throughout this segment. It's only really two, though, that kind of feel like that. The rest are completely different. Yeah, yeah. So he gets dumped into this, uh, the first round, if you will. The first dungeon? Question mark, yeah, sure. And he has his little computer on his wrist, and um, these two, he like gets knocked out or something like the first time that he gets there. Yeah. And he gets attacked by these brownies. One of them is Phil Fondacaro, by the way. Yes. Without a mustache, which is very jarring because I've ne- I don't think I've ever seen him without a mustache. Yeah. He doesn't say anything either. No. no. I-, I was just, again, didn't know the history of the film. I don't know if I'm going to repeat that throughout the episode or if you just get you get it by now. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, halflings, obviously. <laughs> well, sure, yeah. I mean, quarterlings, really. I mean, halflings are basically hobbits. They're pretty short. They can be short. They, I mean, they only go like three to four feet tall. Yeah, but these guys are like a couple feet tall. Sure, sure, sure. So, yeah, they steal his little his little wrist gauntlet with, uh, he st- they steal baby from him. He ends up, like, running around and, like, f- it's just like, it's just like a romp with these two little, these two little buggers and they, and they, um, he finally gets it back from them, but they lead him to this giant stone giant. I don't understand what their purpose in this scene was other than to lead him to this. I, I guess I just said it. I kind of thought it was like an uh, like an offer. Yeah, no, same. Yeah, I agree with that. I think he even boots up his computer at this point, and after the statue comes alive in glorious David Allen stop motion, as always. Oh my god. So good. Yeah, the, the computer's like, oh yeah, this is of Mayan question mark, whatever, uh, uh, build, and... <laughs> what? They say, It says some shit like, like that. That. I miss that. Yeah. I mean, I I, I believe you. That kind of lines up a little bit there. Sure. And so I think I think these these two little guys are like the the worshippers or the tribes people of this giant stone god, and they're like offering him up as a sacrifice. Which I feel like I mean I don't know how many people are doing giant stone walking constructs uh, in 2020, but that is some fantasy ass shit. That is, uh, yeah. you know, I don't know if either of you guys have ever played the video game uh, Breath of Fire for the Super Nintendo, but there's straight up an entire level where you go inside a giant stone construct and you control it. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. Well, I yeah. I, that sounds awesome. I would say uh, Breath of the Wild, each temple is like, temple quote unquote is like that. Yeah. Just in the, uh, the, the new Dark Crystal series, uh, there was a uh, uh, the Guardian, I think he's called. He was made out of all stones. Mm. It's really fucking cool. I mean, I, I like that trope. I mean, I'm not I'm not complaining at all. It's cool. No, sure. And it has uh, it has this crystal on the forehead that uh, you know. Okay, lasers are a big deal in this movie. <laughs> oh man, everybody's got lasers. <laughs> Even the statues. He's trying to. He's trying. So so this thing's coming after him. It's like shooting its laser at him, breathing fire at him and shit. And he's like, oh my god, what do I do? All of a sudden. He gets the capability to shoot a fucking laser out of his computer? Yeah. This is the most impractical laser I've ever seen, too, because he ain't, he doesn't shoot it like... You, when you think someone has a, a gun on their wrist or hand, you think Mega Man. Point forward, shoot forward. No, he shoots it like fucking Ultraman, dude. He puts his fist <laughs> up, and, and it shoots, like, out, like, th- laterally. Yeah, it, <laughs> it shoots out from his forearm. Yeah. And he's got fucking perfect aim almost all the time. Dude, he nails this thing right between right in the fucking crystal in his head and it just explodes. He guyvers the fuck out of this thing. <laughs> he sure does. Oh yeah. And that's it. That's level 1 down. <laughs> yeah, and he just beats it. He's like no fucking sweat, giant stone colossus. Who cares? Yeah, bye. Maybe Esteban should not have given him this fucking computer wrist thing. Yeah. Cause he even says he's like it's not magic it's it's mach- it's machines and then he's like yo yeah, well, fuck you. I I guess the idea is he wants to have that technology versus his technology I guess obviously is the the, the challenge here. Well, he doesn't have technology he ha- he has literal magic and nobody on Earth has literal magic anymore. And for but for some reason like Richard Mole is like the, the waiter almost seems like. Well, my spellcraft is better than yours, and like every time it's not, and like it just sits there. It looks like he's sitting there going, Ugh. like just every time he's foiled. That's why I make the you know devil went down a Georgia joke earlier. <laughs> yeah, it's just... the last time I checked in, you were playing fiddles. <laughs> His ancestor is Charlie <laughs> Daniels. <laughs> yeah, fire on the mountain, run boys, run. That's what I said. Richard Mole has some amazing lines in this movie, and I think this is one of the first ones he drops that just killed me. And he's like looking over at Gwen. And he's like, ah, isn't love grand? <laughs> I'm like, Richard, you're having a fucking field day here, aren't you? My favorite scenes in this movie are all the exchanges they have in this weird limbo-esque purgatory, like, hellscape. Yeah. Because, like, Paul wins a challenge, comes back, 
and they just bullshit for a minute or two. Yeah. And then Richard Bull's like, all right, challenged again. Ah, ah, just teleports him out of here. <laughs> now, who directed the, the wraparound? Who did all that? I literally have no idea. I, I would wager... Um, Either Charles Band? I don't know. I think that probably is it. I think that's I think that's accurate. I, I don't I don't know. Honestly. It didn't say that. It just said like the different parts of it. Right. Yeah. Right. It didn't say like intro part. It just said this part of it, you know? So Right. Never, it, it specifically didn't even mention that now that you're saying it. Well, now that I think about it, the way the film is shot, perhaps the, um, you know, David Allen shot the entirety of the beginning all the way up until this point. Oh, maybe, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it was, and then, and then from here, it's picked up by somebody else. I mean, maybe that sounds completely impractical, but I, who knows? Well, right. They they must have had like one cinematographer, and then everybody was just like sitting in the green room or whatever, waiting to for their turn. Like, okay, show up on set this day, and you just direct or whatever. I was saying, because what you described sounds like something like YouTube collaborators would do, or like animated uh, animator collaborators would do. Which is cool. Yeah. And to think of it at that time is insane. I mean, you think about Creep Show and stuff like that, which is fine, but like that was a collaboration, but George did all of those entries. Yeah. Uh, more more like Tales from the Dark Side, but they're not actually connected to each other per se. Yeah, and this is like this is the narrative through line. And like yeah. one of the reasons why I like these sequences so much is because like every time Paul comes back, like they have like they have these exchanges that almost seem after a while like kind of friendly or like kind of chummy. Yeah, at least. Yeah, just getting to know you, shit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and then like after after a while, like Richard Mole's like, "God, you're so competent. I hate this. Let's, I'm just gonna kill you now." You're not only handsome and smart, but you're brave as well. Fuck you. Why haven't you married him yet? <laughs> <laughs> Basically, you can have whatever you want, you piece of shit. And I'm destined to stay here for the rest of my uh, my eternity. So yeah, he, he bops back to uh, Mistima's fucking arena. They have that exchange. They have a back and forth, and then boom, we're fucking sent back. We're sent into the second level and or segment uh, called the Demons of the Dead, and this one's directed by John Carl Beekler. You know, as soon as they pointed out that this was by Beekler, I fuck. I was like. Of course it was. 110%. Oh, I knew the second that that little creature comes on screen, I was like, oh yeah, this is Beekler. Yeah, rat spit. It wasn't, it was the uh, the zombies for me, because I was like, that looks like what I envisioned when he talks about wanting to put, you know, Tina's dad, Friday 7. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I'm like, that's the kind of, like, gross, disgusting zombie thing I feel like he would come up with. Well, I think his team is doing all the effects for this anyway, but yes, it's very, like, he, he was very adamant about, like, yes, I'm going to have a little creature in my segment, you know what I mean? And... I'm going to voice it. He did? Beekler did the voice? John, he is credited on IMDb as voicing Rat Spit, this little fucking goblin creature. I didn't I didn't even catch that one. Nice one. That's awesome. I had to go in there to kind of figure out what uh, Felix Silla played at the end of the movie. I had to verify that was him. And I was like, oh, shit, there's Beekler. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, but yeah, he fights these undead warriors and just... There's this really cool effect that's not used anywhere else in the film where he cuts, like, the one's head off, and it's kind of like this comic book-esque, uh, I can't even know what to call it other than an explosion where the head gets cut off. It's like a hit effect from, like, a fighting game or something. Like, it's... Yeah, 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 yeah. It is very much like when you hit someone like Tekken or fucking, you know, Street Fighter or something like that where you get the little, you know, the impact, you know, art, I guess you'd call it. But, yeah, instead of, like... A shower of blood, like, when he chops a limb off one of these guys, like, you get some kind of varied, not particle effect, but like I said, yeah, like a hit effect. Yeah. yeah. And this all takes place in this amazing, like, cave with all these stalagmites and stalactites hanging down. It's also, like, one of the shortest pieces of it, too. Yeah. Yeah, I love how, uh, again, like, this is where I was like, oh, our hero, there's no suspense here. Our hero is just good at everything because, like, yeah. fight my zombies. And then Paul's like, K, and then just, like, kicks their asses and he's like, done. And he's like, wait a second. Uh, so Rat Spit is like the caretaker of the dead, and he's like, and he's like, but you haven't fought, fought your greatest challenge, <laughs> Dark Link. <laughs> yeah, Dark, <laughs> Dark Paul. I dare you to cut his head off, and maybe you'll see your face instead of Darth Vader's. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my lord. Mm, learn nothing you have. You gotta use the force. The force, I tell you. The, the <laughs> fucking Texas cheering them on. You brought it here, whatever you whatever you had with you. Uh, this computer that tells me everything. I've seen Empire Strikes Back, you stupid goblin. Ah, shit. I was a little disappointed that this ended up being the shortest segment, but... 
it's still very good. And what we're throwing these rap fire jokes at, like, yeah, this this rat rat spit spit rat whatever the fuck. He calls it spit rat, and it's like, hey, rat spit. It's a rat spit. Like, so yeah, he's like, he's like, ah, you must fight and confront yourself. And like a zombie version of Paul comes forward, and Paul's like, you don't exist. And the thing's like, I don't exist, and he just beats it, and disappears. <laughs> <laughs> just it just walks out of the movie. Yeah, it just. <laughs> yeah, you know, he's played Final Fantasy four. He knows what to do. You just stand there. Paul fired his undead self, and the spit rat's like, damn you. And then he like shoots a laser at rat spit and he's like he's like ah shit and then he starts talking to richard mole and he's like and he's like ah, th- he he gets it we're fucked he has a laser why did you tell me that? <laughs> what why did you agree to this well because he has like a scepter that has like a crystal on it that's controlling the undead and that's what he shoots and it, it blows all the undead up basically also just real quick rat spit like is totally one of the troll puppets from Troll, or a modifi- a mod- modification thereof. Yeah, I could see it. Troll comes out in uh, 87, so it's not the same exact type. It's not the same exact one, but it looks very, very close to it. Sure. I, I mean, he definitely was uh, practicing that troll creature a little bit later, too, if that was actually him working on it. Oh, yeah, I'm sure it, it was It was his company, so, so yeah. So, that's it. And then Richard Moe's like, ah, fuck, he won this one, too. Okay, back here. Why are you so good at everything? Gwen, what don't you see in him? I should make these a little harder, I think. And he hates <laughs> He's like, hey, Paul, what do you think about this? And he starts touching Gwen's, like, tit with, like, the back of his hand. Ah! Which which is even, like, more unsettling. Because while he's, like, accosting Gwen, she bites the shit out of his finger. And then, like, for some reason, I'm not really sure what his plan was here. Paul fires a laser, like, above Gwen's head, but, like, nothing really happens. Yeah, like... Uh, Richard Mole just gets pissed and fires a dragon into the air. I was like, wait a second, did he just turn into a fucking dragon? And then he was like, look at my magic! That's what I thought! But then Paul's like, okay, all right, two could play at that game, and the fucking computer on his wrist generates a giant purple dragon to combat it. Yeah, and like Richard Mole's like, what do you mean, Tuka played that game? What do you do? What? What is this? What What are you talking about? You don't have the powers of hell. What the fuck is this shit? Like Connor said before, this takes place before I'm bound because this is the technology that John Hurt invented that got him the job for the president to make the fucking wormhole in the sky. It's the proto-Buchanan? Uh, yeah, well, that's, that's the advanced version, you know, that's the final form. But like, is this implying that this thing is this powerful outside of whatever this is, dream or reality that this guy's in with his girlfriend, <laughs> that it that it can create all this shit? I guess. Yeah, that it can that it can perfectly emulate the abilities of a supernatural being, like what? Of Satan! Yeah! But <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't just replicate, it fucking trivializes Satan, like it's no big deal. Do you think that he, <laughs> they, they goofed Satan? Like it's just a hologram coming out of the computer? And he's like, oh shit. Maybe, because he doesn't understand it anyway. Yeah, they don't actually fight though, they're just... Just like, okay, I see your dragon's as big as mine. And then they just disappear. Let's see how you handle it. <laughs> he might as well have had Mary and Pippin fire off that fucking firework from the from the fellowship. <laughs> that would have been more effective. It's not the size that counts. There has been a dragon here in 10,000 years. So yeah, this is the part where he's like, hey, you like music? What a fucking bizarre exchange. I love this movie. <laughs> and he pulls out his monkey's album. Also, was that one of the challenges? <laughs> <laughs> the, the the dragon fight that lasted four seconds. No, that's what I'm. I I don't know. That I think that's like a mini, uh, like a bonus round. You know, or that's a dick measuring contest. Oh yeah. <laughs> I love I love the idea of the devil being like, this one doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we're doing this one for shits. I appreciate that you made it purple. That was different. I wasn't expecting that. This is this is for fun. While we you know while we wait for the next challenge to load up. <laughs> The loading screen is taking a little bit longer because this segment's a little bit longer than the last one. So just move the analog stick and the thing will do something funny. Grab Mario's face and pull it around. Move Goku on the Nimbus Cloud. He'll move around and gather up Dragon Balls. <laughs> so he's like, Richard Moe's like, listen to this shit. It's one of my own compositions. And it's like the symphony of hell. It sounds like someone dropped an organ like down a fucking canyon or something. It's just awful. Well, it's the part, it's the part where um, the devil went down to Georgia that where the devil plays. <laughs> yeah, see, exactly. It is very much like th- that in the Primus uh, cover of Devil Down Georgia, like the devil plays this fucking cacophony of awful sounds. Oh, yeah. And then Paul's like, oh, yeah, well, here's my fucking 80s pop rock. <laughs> <laughs> 
Here's my here's my dungeon master score. Go. Yeah. Mastema, you know, he starts foot tapping. He's like, ah, fuck. He's like, oh, then you like that noise or whatever? Oh, if that's the case, then let's turn it up or whatever he says. And he fucking zaps his ass into a wasp concert. This was uh, this really took me off guard. You and me both. I was not ready for him to train. Like he's like, oh yeah, well heavy metal it is, and just fuck yeah, we're at a rock concert, and then he has to fight a bunch of like kiss stand-ins. Dude, I am literally like when the, when he gets teleported into this concert, and I I see them playing. I'm like, wait a second, dude. And I see like behind them, it just says W A S P. I was like, are you fucking with me right now? <laughs> I told you, Blackie's on the cover of the fucking VHS. I, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. But while I'm watching the movie and I'm like, wait, is that Blackie Lawless? Lawless? I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> I, here's the thing. I couldn't pick these guys with a fucking crowd. I, I had no idea who the fuck this, these people were. So this is the third level, a.k.a. third segment, called Heavy Metal, directed by Charles Band. And we're kicking up that fucking Tormentor, dude, because that, that it, this is basically just a fucking music video for Tormentor. Yeah. There's so many close-ups of the lead singer just just singing <laughs> like devoid of narrative context i'm like okay remember when I, when I was like oh well we'll talk about terrorvision a little bit later yeah this is the clips that are played in terrorvision when garrett graham's daughter uh the chick oh, fuck i can't believe i'm forgetting her name from bill and ted anyway she's like empty what about mtv dad and he's like mtv no problem and he like switches the channel and it's the clips from this film of Blackley <laughs> Lawless doing Tormentor. I guess that kind of makes sense with the director of Terrorvision being involved with this film. So I also mentioned that we were going to talk a little bit about Wasp's involvement with Empire Pictures. So they're straight up in this movie. They have an entire segment. Blackley Lawless is essentially the bad guy in this in this uh, segment. <laughs> yeah, uh, playing playing Sammy Kerr. Clearly. Yeah, well, essentially, yeah. We're, we're going to get into it in a second, but, like, then he's in the, you know, there's a clip of this in Terrorvision, and then Wasp uh, writes a theme, or, or, or a song, rather, for Ghoulies 2, Screaming Till You Like It. Oh! <laughs> Ah. And they released that on a picture disc and a 7-inch that I have. So it's a Ghoulies, it's like a picture disc with like Blackie Lawless's face, like with a bunch of Ghoulies on it. <laughs> that is amazing. So I wanted to just tell the story real quick. So Chris Holmes, the guitarist for Wasp at the time, who played on that album and who's actually on stage in this scene, he was at a convention. So I so I bring my my twelve inch my, my my picture disc to get signed. So I go up to him, and he already looks like he's had a couple drinks, and, but he's cool as shit, right? So we're bullshitting and we're talking about the band and the music and stuff. So I pull out the record, and he's like, "Man, fuck me!" And I was like, "I was like, what's the matter?" He's like, "I'm just gonna draw a giant dick on his face." On Blackie Lawless's face, like on my picture disc. I'm like, dude, <laughs> please do not do that. <laughs> I, I would have had an opposite. I'd be like, do it. <laughs> no way. He was like, because he said he had like done it the, the the day previous to somebody else. I was like, can you not do that, please? And he's like, all right. Well, if I was any, if I had any more drinks or like if I was any drunker or some shit like that, then it'd be happening. But he's like, no, I won't do that. I was like, all right, cool. And then he signed it. <laughs> That's it. That is that. If he did that, that is when you see Jolo Skull literally melt into the ground. Um, I've done it where like I asked for something specific. I mean, I'm paying the money, right? Yeah. No. Yeah. And I'm not. I don't think I'm being a dick if I'm asking for something specific. You know. I mean, if you're trying to get a freebie, you get what you pay for sometimes. No, sure. Like if it was just like a, a or like here you go, kid, whatever. I wouldn't complain about anything. But like this is a thing I've seeked out, purchased, waited patiently, bought a ticket, paid you. Please do it the way it has to do. Don't draw a dick on it. I mean, I, I mean, you know, it could be worse. You could take your item, sign it, and you go home, and like someone's like, "Hey, I think he's saying the wrong name." <laughs> well, yeah, the fucking <laughs> the dragon uh, mask. Yeah, or, or it could be you know, it could be James Karen who just refused to write down his most famous line from the Willies. You know, I just think he didn't remember it. And was conf and was confused. I know. I mean, I'm just trying to connect the dots here. Is really what I'm saying. Well, James Caron was like, "Oh, I'm gonna draw a big dick over the fucking Willie's <laughs> <laughs> VHS." Um, but yeah, so I'll post that on the Instagram. There's no dick on his face, but it's the Chris Holmes uh, <laughs> signed uh, picture disc. I I would love it if like he started, and you're like, "No, no, no," and he crosses it out, and like you know, sign, and then you kept that, like, <laughs> yeah, like Clue Gallagher, you mean? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, with the different markers. That's a great story too. Imagine imagine drawing a dick on that, just right into the fucking cat's mouth. <laughs> 
<laughs> right next to where he wrote, this pussy killed me. He might have well as well have. This is a weird fucking scene, by the way. <laughs> it's it's weird. It's it's not even, sorry, Charles, but you're not a director. He basically just, like, he filmed, like, a concert. That's it. Yeah, but it's it looks like somebody who filmed a concert at, like, the Stone Pony who wasn't getting paid that just showed up. Right. And was like, all right, I'm going to take a bunch of shots of the band now. Use it if you want, but it's going to look like shit. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, and there's, like, one or two more shots of me of him, like, Licking the knife, threatening Gwen, licking the knife, threatening Gwen, licking the knife, threatening Gwen, and then he's beaten. Yeah. <laughs> but I love it because he, because Paul goes up to Blackie, like right in the beginning of the concert, and Blackie fucking just like whacks him with the bass. And like Sean said, he gets fucking like Sammy Curd off the stage with like this bolt of electricity. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. It's like an electric, like a blue fucking electricity comes off him. But like, you could have got another minute in a Beekler segment instead of like. <laughs> Exactly. Paul just, like, casually, like, pushing through this crowd. Like, I mean, we've all been there if you've been to a concert. It gets kind of hairy sometimes. Yeah. But did we need that for a solid minute? I don't know. They they promised Wasp most of that song, so I guess that's we're, we're just filling out time. Yeah. Paul, just you have to just stand there until they get to about two-thirds through the song and then make your move. Look befuddled. Only a few people, like, director-wise, can get away with just, like, hey, here's an entire segment where just a band sings a song and you're not going to do anything about it. Like, David Lynch does an entire, like, Twin Peaks Season 3, there's a whole Nine Inch Nails song for no fucking reason. When we get to the crux of the scene, it's, like like, Blackie has Gwen and she's, like, in this, like, metal punker get up and she's like tied in this closet and he has like a machete and he's like he's like licking the machete and shit like about to kill her or whatever and then he like turns into Richard Mole for like a second I guess that was him the whole time is that the implication I guess and then Paul just casually sits down and types in his laser program to disintegrate or whatever yeah. and he defeats Wasp by playing this tone out of his computer and they all fucking disintegrate <laughs> i'd like to know how that one works but okay i question mark i'd like to also get out of this scene as soon as possible and i don't have anything against wasp but this was like a little too long you know what's funny is like paul is basically mega man now like every time he has a new boss encounter he has a new ability he walks in there with <laughs> he like upgrades it's the only way he can beat these bosses <laughs> like but but mega man actually reuses the powers paul never does no oh yeah i mean he reuses lasers but they're always in different form so if you don't rely on launch octopus's homing missiles what are you even doing <laughs> right right <laughs> So that's it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. He fucking blows them up and he and he grabs uh, uh Gwen or he goes to grab Gwen and they and then he gets fucking shat back out in the fucking in uh Mastima's arena. Oh, you're back. I mean, you must have won. Blah 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 blah. And and this is the point where Paul is just like, "Huh, this guy's kind of a chump, right?" And just like starts insulting him like hardcore to his face. He calls him old and he calls him a bunch of shit. He calls him old and fat and like I'm like, "He's not fat. You're just being mean, Paul." Like, <laughs> "You tired old man, you fuck." This is the point where uh, Richard Mole like leans over to to Gwen. He's like, he's like, hey, how about you fuck me instead of that guy? And then all of everything reveals itself. His whole plan is that he just wants to fuck Gwen, and it has nothing to do with Paul. You're a piezo bub. Just a. Take her soul and call it a day. What are you doing fucking around with this uh, challenge or whatever, this rage war? Well, it comes out of here, too. I think he's just fucking bored. Yeah. Hey, you know, and I, I brought up in our chat, I brought up the demon from Demonic Toys and how, like, that dude was just whinging about it. He's like, 67 years, so we yeeted me into a fucking ditch. 66. 66. There we go. Sorry. Yeah, 66 years. 66. You know, you got to get that satanic shit in there. Yeah. 66 <laughs> years, and so, you know, well, before I was yeeted into a fucking ditch or something. Right, before he got Luke Skywalker. Right. He, well, yeah. yeah, exactly. He never seems truly bored to me. Richard Moles, you know, devil man, looks fucking defeated the entire time. Oh, yeah. He goes on a fucking tirade later. He's like, I seen all the plagues and all the wars and all the shit. I'm fucking bored. I'm so bored. Get a Netflix subscription, uh, Richard. I think you'll be okay. <laughs> Someone just rolls a fucking 3D TV up to him. He's like, this is amazing. Oh, my goodness. This will last me for another couple centuries. When did they start doing this? Actually, someone's like, well, this trend is actually over with, so you're good. Get this man a PS4. Get him on an Atari. The man needs something. <laughs> Super Mario Brothers? Yeah. Keeps him busy? Yeah. Now I'm trying to beat it by going backwards. Give a slinky. He's like, oh, man, you fight me a flight of stairs. <laughs> I straightened it. 
Is that how you play this game? <laughs> Paul shoots like a laser at him, and he's like, you fool, there's no way to penetrate this barrier. I have the power of a thousand souls. What is he, Shang Tsung now? Yeah, right? And then, But then I'm like, a thousand? Like, you should have more than that, no? Yeah, billions, zillions. Like, okay, you're bored, but also, are you a lazy Satan? Like, do you only get, like, the motivation to go rile up and fucking... You know, challenge a mortal soul for their, you know, to damn them for eternity, like every hundred years or something. Well, I was thinking about starting an island and a, and a competition where people fight each other. I mean, he can change his form. <laughs> God damn it, Kari Tagawa, you son of a bitch. Yeah, you know, Kari Tagawa took the mask of many faces and put it to much better use. <laughs> So he sends him to the next level, and it's like this ice cave. Yeah, but he gets pissed off at him. He's like, oh, oh, you shut up. Next round. And he, like, drops him through the floor. Here's an ice level for you, douchebag. I brought you here, but fuck you. He drops him into the fucking ice caves from Donkey Kong. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. Filled with, uh, a bunch of terrible, terrible people and Einstein. And Albert Einstein. And Lax Zivrak from... The cantina, the werewolf guy. Yeah, he's there. <laughs> Jabba's in the corner. Oh, ho, oh, oh, ho, chumba wumba. <laughs> it's like a Futurama lineup of, like, history's greatest villains. Like, it, like, Jack the Ripper is there. Werewolf is the, the wolfman's there. Like, yeah. random ass samurai. Other notable historical monsters. I'm like, this is something that Matt Groening would line up to go. I, actually, I think he did. So this is the fourth uh, level, or the fourth segment, uh, Ice Gallery, directed by Rosemary Turco. I, I kind of like the idea more than the execution here. There's not enough time to really explore this no. in any cool way. Which, with what is thrown in your face, yeah. you kind of want it, right? Yeah, No, totally. Yeah, because like the implication here is like, okay, so this is the devil, right? So that means he has taken all of history's greatest monsters, literally put them on ice so he can use them later, I presume? You're angry at this dude. It's like, here, go hang out in my freezer full of serial killers. Have fun, dickhead. Paul's like, every crim criminal in the world is here? And then I'm like, Einstein? Was a criminal? I, on, I mean, on one hand, the Manhattan Project. <laughs> Need I say more? Uh, the atomic bomb. Yeah, but but I think the uh, implication is that he's like the one good guy that you had to find in the group, as we find out. Yeah, I think it's like it's like seeing a, a row of serial killers and having like, oh, what is you know, and, and then insert saintly figure there, and that's the joke. It's that thing where you, you know that Jurassic Park scientist thing, right? You were so uh, obsessed with the idea, if you could, you didn't stop to think if you should. Yeah, right. I think even Einstein went on record and was like, I should have just stuck to making clocks. Oh yeah, he did. He said, I think his quote is. I should have been a watchmaker. Yeah, I should have stuck to making clocks, yeah. Sig Valtzen would have welcomed him. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think he's there, right? Uh, I mean, he pops in when he needs to. I'm here with the clock with the clock maker, with uh, Sig Valtzen. Fenrir's definitely there. <laughs> oh, he's back in a fucking... He's back in the the, the titular runestone, dude. Uh, so, yeah, this is... This is criminally short yeah they, they kind of walk around like it looks like a wax museum at first and they start you know moving snow off things and sees the names of people and they're both there by the way just to clarify paul and gwen are both set in here but like in different parts of it yeah yeah so they're trying to find each other but you know by talking and stuff like that and then gwen just starts to freeze like the rest of these uh these you know popsicles are yeah schwarzenegger st steps in he's like all right everybody chill hello nora i must save you <laughs> aren't you you're gonna be my new wife now put you in the tank <laughs> Ronor Zoro's there, he's posing, you know, he doesn't want to look stupid if he's going to be stuck like that. <laughs> but yeah, so, like, Gwen is, like, frozen and taken again, because, like, the, the the point of these challenges is, like, Gwen is in peril, and then Gwen's not in peril, that's seemingly so. Well, uh, Richard Mould drops Paul through a hole. Oh, that's right, yeah. And then he's like, and then he's like, okay, what are you, cold as something there, Gwen? Let me heat it up. And then guess what happens when everything heats up? All of the monsters are let loose, with the exception of Einstein. I mean, it was kind of telegraphed. But I didn't hate it. Yeah, and also you would think that uh, that this would result in Paul being turned into like just a pile of goop on the floor. Sure. Nah. He's way too capably defeated by like the most evil men who have ever lived. Yeah, I think like like there's like the witch doctor from Beetlejuice. There's Attila the Hun, Jack the Ripper, John Hurt's there, and he just sw he just swats them all away. Yeah, he fights a fucking samurai and wins. Yeah, dude, he just puts the fucking wrist blade up and it just electrocutes the samurai. He like predators this motherfucker. Uh, meanwhile, Jack the Ripper is attacking Gwen and is too preoccupied with like vamping to the camera or the audience or something. And it's just like over posing and dancing and fucking 
looking at his knife and like it takes like all of 45 <laughs> seconds for him to do nothing and get knocked out. Did you know I was the Whitechapel murderer? Ian Holm played me in a very boring interpretation of my story. <laughs> I like it, sort of. I do not. Have you read the, the graphic novel based on my account of my murders? And that's exactly why I don't like it. <laughs> but like Joe was saying, you know, Einstein, for whatever reason, is the only one that doesn't defrost. And uh, as, as the fucking literal mummies coming at them, they kick her kick it to the side and it like tumbles into all of them <laughs> and they're like ah we, we need the ice the ice and i'm like did i miss something yeah well i think the there's like an ice crystal like in the throne where einstein is like propped up yeah he's holding it yeah is that what kept him frozen it was just too cold <laughs> i guess it was like the big crystal that mr freeze is looking for <laughs> Nice. The big diamond. Um, no, I don't know. And then t- he blows it up with a laser question mark, and they win. Yeah. Guess what happens next? They go back to Mistima <laughs> in his arena. That sounds like a fucking barbecue joint. Come down to Mistima's arena. We're going to cook him some hogs. Yeah, it's across the street from Esteban's nightclub. <laughs> Esteban. Mistima is shocked like every time he completes one of these challenges, but they are like, they're the easiest riddles or puzzles uh, that you could really think of, at least up to this point. And they're always, and like, this is like, you know, you contribute this obviously to the movie and like the budget constraints, but like, they're always very small in scope and so self contained that like, the solution to every problem in these things is like, usually directly in front of Paul's face. Oh, and, uh, since Mr. Freeze was invoked, and uh, I forgot to mention it, but we, we kind of have to. Paul even makes a Mr. Freeze-ass joke while he's in this cave. <laughs> what does he say? He goes, he looks at Gwen, he goes, keep cool. And then, like, he thinks about what he just said. He goes, cool. Chill. What killed the dinosaurs? The Ice Age. <laughs> what happened to Einstein? The Ice Age. <laughs> Mistima. But yeah, they get teleported back, and uh, Mistima's like, ah, oh, yeah, you know, I got a, I got a uh, proposition for you. What if uh, I let you go free, and I get Gwen? And she's like, yeah, he's not going to go for that. And he's like, yeah, I'm not going to go for that. Well, what if I uh, sweeten the deal? <laughs> and this big ass uh, chest of gold <laughs> pops up in front of him, and Paul's like, huh. Nah, I'm good. I'm only in debt. It's fine. It's like you could build, you could build your own mansion or whatever. There you go. And then Mistima's is like, well, if that doesn't uh, wet the uh, proverbial whistle, how about this? Three hot women that are climbing all over you. And Paul kind of like loses himself for a second. Yeah. He's like three for one. That's my last offer. What do you say, Paul? And like instead of just Paul, like no, he's like. He's thinking about it. He's looking around. He's smiling. He's thinking about fucking Dracula's castle. <laughs> some weird, some weird menage a trois. But then Gwen's like, ah, uh, Paul, and he's like, oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, no. I'm good. Uh, I was. I'm only half masked. All right. I, I'm not taking it, Mistima. He's like, damn, good try. I forgot. I'm flawless and just steps forward. Yeah. Imagine if he just split. He was like, all right. If he just took the girls and left. Yeah. <laughs> Mistima's like, that actually worked. I can't believe it. Oh. Um. Okay. Okay, uh, here you go. Well, Gwen, uh, what do you like to eat? <laughs> I'm a terrible cook. And then I, he, I don't know what prompts this, but he's like, yeah, there's no fool like an old fool. Hey, yo! <laughs> you know, yeah, he, he heard that one from our friend Sal. Whoa, cool it, Pops. You want to blow your pacemaker? What is this, a goddamn depression? <laughs> Oh, that's right. Yeah, because this is when he starts calling him old and fat. He's like, you're old and fat and bored. He's like, I because at this point, like, the, the strings are starting to show, and Paul's like, this isn't, like, there's no point to this other than you need something to do. Yeah. Right, he call, he calls Mistima a wipe. It's it's awkward. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Night of the Demons, everybody. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Movie Dumpster episode 30? Season one? Uh, it, it, you know, it's the one on Halloween. Episode 31, I believe, on Halloween, which was October 31st, I think. Anyway, season one, Night of the Demons. Like how we worked that out. Yeah. Then we get this, uh... <sighs> this is weird. The weirdest scene in the whole movie, in my opinion. Okay, so this is the fifth level, and it's a uh, slasher. That's what it's called, Slasher by Stephen Ford. Now, this is the only thing Stephen Ford's ever directed. Do you think he, like, championed for this? Like, he's like, all right, so you have this whole movie, right, where I could do anything I want (laughs) for, like, a a game level. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to write a motherfucking murder mystery New York slasher movie. (laughs) That is top loaded with footage of our main character running. Uh, That's most of the segment. (laughs) Well, call back. You brought it up earlier. Yep. Okay, I just saw this great movie. It's called Maniac. (laughs) (laughs) Right? (laughs) 
literally. You know, you slip a little Dr. Giggles in there with the scalpels, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's got a scalpel collection. We'll get to it. Yeah, I uh, I wasn't really into this segment at all no. until I saw the, you know, our, our you know titular killer here. It's fucking weird. And I was like, oh, it's a singer from AHA. I'm okay with this. <laughs> George Michael? No. I was going to say it's body by Jake before he started working out. Paul falls right into part eight, <laughs> and he passes Alfonso Ribeiro. He fucking waves at him, and he picks up, like, this newspaper, and it says, and it's like a, it's like, the slasher takes another victim, and it's like a picture of Gwen, and he's like, oh, no. Could you be more on the nose? You really think they're going to print in the newspaper the slasher? They're going to say serial killer kills another person. Well, I think that's, like, the name, because he's killed a bunch of people already, so that's what they, they gave it to him. Well, sure. So he, like, finds finds his body like under some cardboard or whatever and then a disembodied Richard Mole is just like yeah that paper that you just saw is tomorrow's news so you have until whenever to to find the killer and make sure he doesn't kill Gwen bye I got it from Biff this is awfully contrived isn't it <laughs> it's a, I, I it took me a long time to think of this one I'm trying something new the majority of this Paul is just in a cop car he gets picked up by the police. Immediately. Yeah. Immediately. And he's like, the cop's like, what, what the fuck do you think this is? Halloween or some shit? Did you kill that woman? Get in the car, you fuck. This one cop with the mustache is hilarious. Oh, man. Because he is just bitching and complaining to the other guy driving. Hey, what kind of donut is this? After he's already bitten it. <laughs> Uh, jelly. Oh, uh, I hate jelly. Why would you ever buy me a jelly donut? Oh, it tastes disgusting. He goes, what kind of donut am I eating? And he's like, I don't know, jelly. He's like, jelly? I hate jelly. Why'd you buy jelly? What's all that red stuff in my mouth? I've been telling you I hate Joe since you married me. <laughs> <laughs> but he keeps eating it. And then he looks at, uh, he looks at, uh, Paul. He's like, uh, what are you, dressed like Gumby or something? <laughs> what are you supposed to be? Gumby? That that man has never seen Gumby's in, no. in his life, ever. This man doesn't exist is the problem. The only comparison to Gumby you could even make is that it's kind of the same green. That's it. I t oh, and he goes, oh, where's Pokey? Oh! Yeah, get it? I have a question regarding these, like, weird existential scenarios that, you know, Miss Dima comes up with, because after this one's resolved, it appears to keep going? Yeah, this is the only one. Like, <laughs> like the narrative within that little world just continues? Are we implying that with Jack the Ripper, Bloody Mary, and Louis the Thirteenth, the werewolf is real? <laughs> is Einstein really frozen in hell? <laughs> Probably. It's just a weird decision to have, like, because like, he eventually like, finds Gwen. She's at, like, the uh, the dance studio from the beginning, isn't she? Yeah, there's, like, there's, like, another movie happening, right? And they just kind of pop into it. Yeah. <laughs> they, they interrupt someone else's slasher movie. <laughs> yes! All right, because we see him in the murder basement with newspaper clippings as any slasher or serial killer would do you know ask terry o'quinn he knew all about that part yeah he t he's got his clippings he fucking pastes them on his wall he takes out his favorite scalpel and he goes on the hunt i love how he has like the different blades in the uh yeah he's got like a wooden box with them he's got like his little exacto kit he got from michael's yeah the funny thing is like because i you know work in medicine i'm like oh is that a 15 blade is that an 11 blade what size is that, is that a 10 blade what's that one used for <laughs> <laughs> what's the where was the millimeter run that day. While they're in the cop car, you know, Paul's trying to break out of the cuffs with a laser beam and they hit a fucking bump. <laughs> And he gets the shit shocked out of him. They're like, oh, is there a problem back there? He's like, oh, oh, bump me right. You guys need new shocks. They're like, ah, oh, you wise ass. We spend entirely too much time in that car. And then he gets out by lasering himself out of the fucking handcuffs and then throws himself from the vehicle. Yeah, they don't smell any burning metal or anything. They're just like, huh. Okay. P.S. Those doors don't open from the inside in the back seat, by the way. No, that's the whole point. Look, the man has a laser, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess he could have technically shot the lock, which he very well may have, and I missed it. But, uh, yeah, Joe, you're 100% right. Paul can open closed police doors, and he can also divide by zero, okay? He's got that <laughs> He's got that norm power where he just touches it and it opens? Yeah. He doesn't afraid of anything, okay? I think the, th the big thing that confuses me about this segment is that, like, Gwen is... In every other level, she's aware. She's she's right. like she's exact. She it nothing's changed, right? She knows exactly where she is, what's happening, and all that kind of shit. In this segment, it's like she loses her memory until Paul finds her. Yeah, she's like an active participant in the scenario. Like she's just playing a role until like she has Paul directly in her line of sight. I I guess like that's it, that, it's just a very weird part of this level. I I think you know what Joe's saying is a hundred percent right. I don't think she ever realizes that. You know, this is not a part of the uh, 
Richard Mole nightmare because she doesn't really get her memory back until the next segment. She's 100% thinks this is all actually happening until the last possible second. Yeah, which is strange to me because that hasn't happened in any other level is what I'm saying. Like, is that actually Gwen? Uh, or is that some, like, vis- visage of her and Mitch- Richard Mole's just fucking with him? Uh, maybe. The case in point is she's aware in every other segment and this is the only one where she kind of plays somebody else and, like, goes to the dance recital hall because she's a dancer or some shit. Yeah, which, which I kind of like how this is like really darkly lit uh kind of you know you think back to that earlier scene you're like huh all right this is a pretty cool movie yeah no it, it it's not bad it's just severely out of place here it looks like maniac like it, it has that very you know yeah like, oh yeah nighttime e stalker feel nighttime new york dude yeah straight up and, and of course since we talked about it already, but we get this scene with him literally running through this town to get to the dance studio for like a minute straight. Full fucking sprint. He fucking has the computer on his wrist, like scramble a car's radio and like feed the guy different information. Like, oh, the the suspect is on the fifth street and then he drives away, which I thought was kind of neat. Yeah. It's just very strange. <laughs> And then he like, yeah, and then like you said, he's running for like what seems like three fucking minutes of this of this segment. It's like the whole scene where Batman's on the motorcycle in Dark Knight trying to get to the Joker. <laughs> but he gets there, and I feel like the only reason they had uh, Gwen be a dancer is so they could have this shot where he fucking bounces a laser off the wall, off the uh, dance mirror to hit this guy. Uh, sh- like, everything's closing up, and she's in the back. The killer comes, goes to stab her, and then Paul just shoots him. Right. Yeah, I also, I did love when he walks into the studio, because I didn't realize what, you know, where he was at first. Yeah. He enters the room, and, like, he gets close, as he gets closer to the mirror, like, his reflection pops up, but the rest of the room is not lit well enough for you to see it, so it just looks like there's just a mirror image of him coming at him, and you're for a split second, you're like, what the fuck? I thought it was cool looking. Oh, that's kind of neat. It's easily the best part of this particular segment. Sure. Still not great, but the best part. Because, you know, of course he's got to, you know, introduce his whole uh, reflector laser that he's going to be using for the rest of the movie. Yes, especially the next segment. <laughs> he saves her. The guy, I, I thought he was dead, but he, I guess he just got knocked out for a second. Listen, the laser kills everything that it shoots in this film. Not the slasher, man. Yeah, but not the slasher, dude. He's got laser protection or some shit. He's he's really a half-orc. He has that ability where when you go down to zero, he comes back up to one. You know, D&D. <laughs> <laughs> And he's weak enough because the so they they like zap out of existence and the cops run in and then just pick up the slasher. They're like, "Oh, did you see that? Nope. Nope, sure didn't. Okay, let's book this fucking guy even though we have no- our weird existence inside this micro universe." But they have no evidence of this guy, you know what I mean? I'm talking about the story that we don't see. Right, is there really a slasher? Yeah, and the, their lead-in is, like, Paul showing up and going, call the police, there's going to be a murder, which is very suspect, first of all. Like, <laughs> right? Myra is like, are you going to do the murder, or is somebody else do the- what's happening? All right, well, just grab that guy with the scalpel. Okay, it's him. So we go back to Mole's arena, and, uh... <laughs> You know, this is the first time we keep calling it zapping because, like, when you're watching this movie, that's what it literally looks like. It's just like a flash and some shit happens. Yeah, but uh, Gwen specifically is like, ah, he's going to zap us again. And Mr. <laughs> Mole's like, zap? What do you mean, zap? <laughs> and Paul's like, oh, yeah. He's like, hey, I'll zap you. And he just does, like, a finger gun towards Richard Mole, and he just about jumps out of his skin. That was a good gag. What magic is this? <laughs> and he's like, oh, you want to fuck with me? Okay, power of Astaroth. Summon my demon in the fucking, in the fire right there. Well, because they keep saying, oh, well, you know, if if you really wanted to kill us, he would have done it right in the beginning. He wouldn't make us go through all this bullshit. And Richard Mole's like, uh, yeah, uh, look at this shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's an excellent point here. Meet my lost soul. <laughs> <laughs> the closest Dungeons and Dragons thing, just to keep this thread going that I could even compare this to, I guess it's like a flame skull, but it's like a flame demon head. I, I don't know what the fuck they're going for with this. Uh, beats me, dude. He's like, oh, you can't defeat this. And Paul like just shoots a laser at it and it disappears. <laughs> <laughs> he just zaps it with the fucking laser. And it's just like, oh, and it disappears. <laughs> Literally defeating the powers of hell with this computer laser. Paul hasn't like really broken a sweat yet either. No. Even, even all that running, he's not sweating. Yeah, he's there's not, there's not a scratch on him. He doesn't have any grime or like, no, he's the first this thing from like John McClane you can get as far as like you know a a hero who's gone through some shit no he's not going through shit this is like a Tuesday to him (laughs) no he's a perfect specimen and he runs every day after work so he's good I mean he's part of that program we heard about in the beginning that we got no more detail on so sure yes put him in the cyber next this the Cyrax program (laughs) oh my god the Lin Kuei come in and just take him (laughs) 
<laughs> that's what happens at the end? Yeah, that's why it was called Cyrax. We just, uh, you know, you signed the contract. You should have read the fine print. <laughs> <laughs> LK unit P-A-U-L. <laughs> Well, Excalibur! They just install Cal into the back of his head. Paul, use a Lin Kuei? Use a Lin Kuei, Paul! <laughs> So he fucking shoots this fire, and then Richard Moe's like, God damn it, you foiled me again, next level, Psst. He basically gets sent back to level one, but like a different part of the area, and he's like, huh, this this mysterious cave with a red light and steam coming off it, I guess it's volcanic. So this is Cave Beast, the sixth segment, second to the last one. We're almost there, dumpster dwellers. <laughs> and who directed this one? Peter Manugian did this one. I... Which is strange, because it's just very... Bleh. Flat out, don't like this segment. Yeah. Yeah, me neither. I... Okay, so let's just talk about it. I'll, ex I'll explain the part I do like. Okay. First of all, we get this Beakler-ass troll creature that's in there that I guess he just assumes he has to fight. Oh, dude, he f that, that fucking thing fell right out of Bava's demons. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, he, you know, he has to go in the cave because he hears, like, Gwen, you know, say, Ah, oh, help, help! And he, at first he's not buying it, but he's like, Ah, I guess I better go in there. When he goes in there, he sees the demon peeking around the corner. He's like, oh, you motherfuck, you sneaky fucker. I thought Gwen was, like... Trapped in there. Like, on a table on top of that thing. There seems to be, like, a cauldron or something. I thought he was, like, going to dip her in the fucking cauldron and cook her or some shit. I don't know. Right, she puts her hand out the top of it and gives a thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> As she sinks into the <laughs> stew. <laughs> No one can decide our future. He just fights this thing because I guess he assumes that's what has to be done. And this is where he just starts reflecting uh, laser beams off of rock surfaces. Uh, this is weird, too. Be well, f okay, before he even whips out the laser, he's th he starts throwing rocks at this thing. Why? And he's like, I'll get you, you fuck. And he they're like throwing rocks at each other. Yeah, the setup is super bizarre because there really isn't any. He walks in this cave and just decides to start throwing rocks at something. Yeah, and then like it throws rocks back but it also has lasers that come off of the rocks. Okay, he's taking these like little crystals and it looks like he's throwing them and then the, like when they land, they shoot a laser? Right. Oh. Yeah, is that what's happening? I, I guess. This is one of the more confusing parts of the movie to be, in my opinion. Yeah, because like he, he looks at the computer and it's like, I'm trying to trace the trajectory, Paul, but it's not gonna work, so figure something out. Also, and he, yeah, yeah. And he does. So one, the computer's like, it can't be done, and it just happens. By accident. <laughs> well, because, like, because the idea is to bounce the laser and hit the demon or whatever, but instead he, like, hits a rock in the ceiling and it causes a cave-in and crushes this fucking thing. Right. And I think there's, like, these, like, rods that have, like, crystals on it that this thing is then, like, bouncing its laser off of, and then he bounces the laser off of that also, and it hits the ceiling and drops the rod. It's, it's overly complicated for what the end result is. It's contrived. And the end result is fucking weird <laughs> yeah well this is the only part i like of this i think this is the same yeah so the fucking rock falls on him on this demon and then it transforms into an angel question mark glinda the white witch of the north yeah it sure was she didn't get a house dropped on her she got a fucking boulder dropped on her just tap those ruby slippers to wake up i think <laughs> I thought it was uh, Gwen for like two seconds, and I'm like, wait a second. Oh, yeah, so did I. I was, I was really confused. They just shoehorned another character in here. Well, right, because I was like, oh, Richard Mull, you dirty rat. You fucking turned that, you turned Gwen into a monster, and instead of not, like, he was supposed to not kill it, but he ended up killing her. That's what I thought. That would have been crazy. Yeah, that would have been pretty good, but it's not that. It's just like some other random person who's like, thanks for freeing my soul. I was stuck in a demon. Um, okay, well, uh, you, bye, and then she just disappears. Yeah, and she's like, she's like that. She's like, well, c congratulations, you've killed me, which is not the thing you were supposed to do. You should have left the cave. And he's like, oh, rat. She's like, too bad. Well, it doesn't matter. You won anyway. And then she just fucking flies off. <laughs> well, right. <laughs> Teleports out of there. It's a win-win situation. And this is the thing I did like about this, even though it's contrived as hell, and I really wish they explained it better. Uh, the idea that oh, you could have just left and not fought this thing, and it would have counted as a W, but because he went in and actually defeated the creature and freed her soul, she's like, yeah, you could have won in a much easier fashion, but you took the hard route and you saved my soul. So I guess thanks. I, I, I think that's what they were trying to imply there is just really poorly conveyed to the audience. No, I mean, I get that part, but you, does he get like bonus points? Gets like an enchantment or something? <laughs> Why would he need an enchantment? Nah, I guess it just proves he's a good dude, I guess, even though he killed it. Question mark? He killed this fucking thing. Well, at least she's not in a a, a never-ending hell inside a volcano where she has to throw crystals at people every few centuries. This is true. <laughs> Even when he loses, this guy wins.
Jones. <laughs> Fuck me, man. So then we we go back to the arena. One, you know, again. Come on back down to Mistema's arena. Woo-wee! We got fucking rattlesnake bites for the kids and cornbread wedges. What the fuck does he say to Mistema? <sighs> He's like, a hizma. It means respect for every living being. And Mistema's like, ah, that god shit. He just comes back, and then all of a sudden, Richard Mole's on his throne, and he's like, I once had, when I was a lad, I had a cat, and we covered it in fucking tar, and then lit its tail on fire, and watched it squirm until it died, and its fucking eyes popped out, and its guts burst out. And then Paul's like, you gotta be a himsa. And he's like, what is that word? And he's like, a himsa, you know, somebody who cares about life and stuff. They just transition into, like, a philosophical conversation about the nature of, like, respecting all life. It's super weird. Uh, I don't know what the fuck that is. I've never heard that term. Neither has Satan. Is that, like, a Jewish thing? Is that, like, Yiddish? <laughs> you know, you gotta do the himsa. I don't, what, the the what? Do you know what Meshuggah is? <laughs> Not himsa, himsa. Right. I mean, that's what I'm, you know, where's Crookshank when you need him? He could have translated. Oh, maybe. I do not know what himsa. I don't know what that is. Maybe I should use it for a code word. That makes sense. If he used that as a code word, this fuck, the, the, whatever winner stepfather they got, that program would never be activated because no one, I've never heard of that word until I watched this movie. Well, no, I have to endow him with powers from beyond. So himsa is part of this one. <laughs> that secret one, we keep that book over here for now. Don't ask questions and Crookshank won't tell you answer so then like richard mall's like oh, oh you, you you think your god looks down on you with tenderness and mercy he's like you know humanity is the devil he's like he's like it's, the human race is that red red with teeth and claws and you know it's fucking gross and you're, you're a piece of shit and you think you're fucking nice but you're not i mean Okay, yes, not going to disagree with that. But also, Paul, he's not like a role model per se, but he doesn't seem like that bad of a dude besides the fact that he's obsessed with his computer. I mean, he fucks his computer. That's not that weird, uh, considering. Mo- mo- yeah, exactly. Also, he's a man. He's not n- man. Does that make sense? Oh, oh, right. Well, right, exactly. To quote Tommy Lee Jones, he's like, a person is smart, but people are stupid. Right. No, exactly. So then we go to the, uh, we go to Tatooine. Tatooine? <laughs> yeah. Whatever. I've I've only seen Star Wars about a hundred times. I don't even know what the name of the fucking planet is. <laughs> there's two different ones. There's Tatooine and then there's Dantooine. Uh, God damn it, George Lucas. And then there's Jakku. There's no space. There's no there's no uh you know hip club spaceport. Uh, okay. Uh, you know what if I just add like one letter in between this spot here? People will know exactly what I'm talking about, right, guys? You know, I'll just confuse the shit out of Joel Scola when he's a child and thinks that they blow up Luke Skywalker's home planet, but. Grand Moff Tarkin doesn't. He blows up Dantooine. I'll confuse the hell out of Sean O'Rourke, who's uh, watched all these movies more times than he can count and still doesn't know what the fuck the name of any of the planets are called. Oh, I'm sorry. He blows up Alderaan. Never mind. See, you just did it to yourself. Yeah. Fuck me up. Well, she Leia reveals that it's on Dantooine, and, and he's like, See, Vader, that wasn't that hard. Fire, Ren, ready. Blow up this bitch's planet. Right. Exactly. Yeah, a- anyway, we enter, again, the Star Wars slash Mad Max segment. Mad Max, yes. Um, I- I'm really not sure which one you want to take, you know, uh, you know what what <laughs> examples you want to make in this segment, but I was getting some hardcore Mad Max uh, n- a New Hope re- uh, feels. They're beyond Thunderdome, let's put it that way. There's a, there's a faction in the Mad Max game that are in the, they're in Fury Road for a few minutes. They look like buzzards, who are these guys that were usually wear, like, weird, kind of, like, raggy clothing, and they have facial, like, they have like masks kind of like this uh yeah they look like a bunch of knockoff uh buzzards and then they have their fucking like their their weird you know short person man slave ish thing who's just chirping them. right who comes in phil fondacaro's car from double double toil and trouble oh yeah man the clown car that goes really fast yeah he borrowed it mm-hmm. played by felix uh Silla, by the way that's who that was <laughs> yup oh my goodness who is just constantly just saying the same thing over again we gotta kill him we gotta kill him we gotta shoot can we shoot him now he's like he's like can i kill him if you're gonna kill him i'll shoot him now later are we gonna eat him or uh, what because i had read that he was in the movie before i watched it and he hadn't popped up yet and i was like all right this this is, if this isn't him, I don't know where the fuck he was. D- who did he play? Who was he again? Wasn't he, um... Uh, he is, uh, Cousin It. Yeah, he's Cousin It. You know what's funny about that? In the in the new Adams Family movies, like the Raul Julia ones, Jonathan Franklin plays Cousin It. The, the fucking kid, uh, uh, Isaac from Children of the Corn. Oh my god. Yeah. And, and of course, he has also played an Ewok in Return of the Jedi, so, you know, he was, he felt right at home. <laughs> 
Right, right. Especially when Gwen, in a few minutes, just decides, hey, uh, you remember Princess Leia? I'm going to basically channel her for the next five minutes. Pretty much. Uh, because they, you know, they get attacked, and, uh, you know, the wrist uh, communicator, whatever the fuck, the Omni-Tool uh, power glove gets taken. Yeah, real quick, before you keep going, uh, this is the seventh and last segment, uh, Desert Pursuit, which might as well just be called Mad Max, and it's directed by Ted Nicolau. But also takes place in the airplane graveyard at the from the end of uh, that one movie with Nicolas Cage. I think it was called Con Air. Con Air. <laughs> and he's, he's somewhere out there with air blowing his hair around. <sighs> Feels good. But, uh, yeah, they, they take the wrist thing, and they, they're, they're fucking with it, but they won't give it to Felix Silla, so he just leaves in his car. He just quits. He's like, ah, I'm going to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. just fucking walks away. It's like when fucking uh, the, the vampires are fucking with Blade's uh, titular, you know, the blade, <laughs> his sword. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. And it, like, cuts their fucking hands off. Well, that's basically what happens, because he's just verbally talk. They don't, don't even, like, put a sword to this guy's throat or, like, a, a foot on him or anything. They're just like, yeah, keep talking, whatever. It, ca- it can't possibly mean anything bad. Why didn't he just kill him? Well, yeah, because he's like, yeah, laser, shoot these assholes. They're like, huh? And they all get killed. Yeah, but he, like, he announces every one of his intentions via instructions to the device. He's like, Cal, uh, here, shoot at these fucking coordinates. And <laughs> none of these guys pay any attention to him. All their focus is on this wrist thing. And he just murders all three of them as they're unaware. The first thing he says is, uh, hey, Cal, uh, uh, is your laser still equipped? <laughs> right. And it's like... Yes, Paul, it is. I just assumed he had to reactivate it every time. I didn't know it was just like, if you set that one to go, like like you guys were saying, like Mega Man, it's just, it's already in, in gear. It doesn't even have to charge. Yeah. And it has modifications. It makes modifications to itself live. Because he's like, okay, set a trajectory for this coordinates, this coordinates, and this coordinates. And it's not like you could even argue like they don't speak his language. Because again, Felix Silla is saying, can we kill him? Can we kill him? Can we shoot him? Can we shoot him? Yeah. Over and over and over again. <laughs> also, how did, how, did, how did Paul know those coordinates? I don't know. He's supposed to be really smart. Smart, remember? He's the smartest person on earth, seemingly. So the he fu- he fucking gets the the wrist laser to shoot these three fucks, and they hijack a, a war rig. And it what it literally tra- wipe transitions into them in a fucking death car. Uh, this war rig death car, it looks like that piece of shit car Elon Musk revealed like not that long ago at a conference. <laughs> In his weird tuxedo. When you said Ellen Musk, I just pictured Ellen DeGeneres. Oh, God. Those are two people that I do not want uh, to fuse or be involved in anything MDU related. Just going to put that out here now. No. So they're driving in this Mad Max ass scene. Like, oh, yeah. I, like, I, I'm trying to sit here and think, like, what's running through their mind? Like, how do they beat this mission? <laughs> they're like, I guess if we just drive a little while, something will happen. Yeah, because Gwen's like, I hope you know where you're going. As they have a goal of some kind. <sighs> the, the, this one is the most tedious to me. The tiny wastelander just shows up in this vehicle again, and then they have a fucking, they have a shooty-shooty duel. Yeah, she shoots him, and he blows up. She's like, ah, all right, I, you know, th- this is where she goes full Princess Leia, and just like, th- I guess they took one of the guns from the sand people from earlier, and she's just, just like, blast! these motherfuckers she fucking shoots felix silly he fucking explodes and flips over and then he's like oh wow well, we didn't shake him yet and then she does the same thing to the other car blows it up and then she's like oh yeah yeah sweet we did it she's like yeah <laughs> Richard Mull, like, magically takes control of the car? Uh, yeah, he turns into Penguin for a second. Yeah, well, he cheats twice. He cheats here, and we'll get to it. But, um, he fucking, so he takes control of this car, and then, like, makes another car appear, and then crashes them together, and they all explode in a fiery death. And then end up back in his fucking arena. Right, and then he's, like, basically saying, well, you lost, I guess I get your soul. And then Paul is like, hey, you know what? I have a persuasion score of, like, plus 100. Uh, hey, what what if we just don't do that and we just have, like, one more fight that, you, that, you know, you're not contractually uh, uh, obliged to uphold, but, uh, come on. Come on! He's like, he's like, you big fat overlord, you stupid idiot. He's like, this isn't a contest. He's like, you, you're bored, man. He's like, you don't know the thrill of being immortal and that could lose, man. So he's like, why don't you just cut the bullshit? No magic. No nothing. Right. The only rules are that I, me and my, me and Gwen leave, and we're good to go. 
And then Richard Mole just, with his fucking seven feet of monstrous man, just starts attacking Paul. Right. I, okay, I love this sequence because he comes at Paul, like, like, pose like the iron fucking sheik. <laughs> his arms are fucking all the way out. And he's coming at him like he's going to bear hug him. And then somehow they end up over by, like, a volcano. Yeah. Oh, they end up on Mustafar. I have the high ground, Anakin. Hayachi's there throwing Kazuya in there. And he, like, looks over and he's like, oh, what the fuck's <laughs> happening over there? <laughs> on the other side, yeah. Oh. Obi Wan, Anakin, Ka- Kazuya, uh, Heihachi, and these and these two <laughs> all stop and make them across the ravine. Like, what are you doing here? Oh <laughs> yeah, and the American Dragon Ball cast is there too. Oh, my God, <laughs> fighting those fucking monsters that turn into bridges or whatever. Everyone just pauses. Like, hold on, are we all at the same volcano? <laughs> Come on, guys. And and Justin Chatwin is like, yeah, I still don't know how I'm gonna get back over there. Just 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 cut. Just cut. I'll be over there after we come back. <laughs> we'll get we yeah we're good. Just keep going. So then like. Somehow, some way, Paul, without any magic or technology, overpowers Beelzebub and throws him into this fucking volcano, and then he's just dead. That was the deal. He said no magic or anything from from uh, from Richard Mole. But again, I can't stress enough. Like Paul is peak is peak physical condition. Like he's sure pretty built. I mean, he is thin, but he's he's not like a brick shit house. But he could probably fuck this dude up a little bit if he tried. I mean, yeah, if he, if he is basically just like Charnetsky in every other way but personality. Yeah, because he's been sitting on his ass for a millennia. I guess he'd be pretty out of shape. Yeah, I think. <laughs> I think that's what it is. Like, that's why he lost, because he was out of shape as fuck. He stood up and blew both quads. He's like, ah, oh, damn it. <laughs> Ay, shit. <laughs> he pulled a Vince McMahon. Paul beat the fuck out of him. He got that fucking, that big backhand on fucking Paul, and then he, like, got out of breath, and then Paul got the upper hand. This this is the part where I became very confused. What was the danger to Paul that he needed to have the uh, this giant laser beam fly out for him to grab onto? Because he looked like he was just, like, laying on the edge there to me. Well, first of all... Uh... Richard Mole, like, says some kind of incantation, which, like, breaks the ledge. Kinda. Kind of. And then he's, so he's already cheating. And then Paul, like, pushes him over. He falls into the volcano. And then of its own accord, the computer shoots, like, a fucking pole made of energy, pure energy. And he, like, Paul, like, grabs onto it and, like, pulls himself up. Because he's gonna fall in, like he doesn't have the the footing to like get up from where he's at. I think. I uh, unless I just my eyes aren't working. It looked like he was literally laying down at the edge of this fucking uh, cliff and just like reached up and grabbed the pole and just like kind of stood up. This man's core strength is incredible. Like just sure. just flip backwards or whatever. You know what I mean? It, it it was slightly confusing for me, but I I okay sure whatever let's move on with the plot uh yeah i'm also more perplexed as to how powerful that fucking computer is because now it create matter out of nothing yeah what the laser was already question mark but now it's like okay here you go here's a bridge yeah now you can just make things out of nothing like you can create like structures that can be interacted with (laughs) (laughs) so that's pretty much it paul like grabs gwen and they get transported back to their apartment and they're like oh we're back we're back how about you uh excalibrate she's like i'm fine i'm a i'm a regular computer now not a wrist gauntlet they're like great and then gwen's like hey paul let's get married because excalibrate told us we should and he's like let's do it (laughs) that's it yep and then it just and then it goes on like the credits are just like they tell you like who directed each fucking like segment and then it just goes to like regular credits which i do appreciate because again some of them i could you know you could tell and some maybe not so much it's just weird because they like not sure what they wanted to make and they were like well fuck it here we go (laughs) yeah perfect but yeah so uh so where are we putting this oh shelf absolutely um this movie is it's like a small table of like little tiny snacks that are all like you all like you really like each one of them Mm. and it just kind of gives you all that sequentially it's not an anthology like we said but it's a weird approach to like that kind of a movie where it's just this like series of odd scenarios that like we said, feel like a video game. It feels like fucking Ninja Gaiden with the transitions where you're just like, <laughs> you're like, you're in a subway station. Now you're in a castle. Or like the evil within. Um, uh, Richard Mole is amazing. Uh, Paul is uh, oddly charming. And the longer the movie goes, you're like, wow, this guy can't do anything wrong. And it's, I don't know, it's just amusing from start to finish and really holds your attention. So yeah, shelf. Oh uh, yeah, totally. Uh, on the shelf. <laughs> um, so much so that I 
had to rip this movie from my VHS for Sean and Connor because we could not find it <laughs> available online, streaming or otherwise. Yeah. And and I, I had said this to Joe before we started recording, but when we had mapped out the schedule for the year, obviously there's a little thing, you know, things move around a little bit, but we pretty much had it figured out. Yeah. We, we looked it up from what I recall, and it was on Tubi or Amazon or something. So in that time frame, the licensing must have uh, lapsed. It's also one of those things, too, I don't think about it. Right? Because sometimes, like, when I have the movie, I'm like, oh, yeah, we should do that. And then I, I totally don't think about how you guys are going to acquire it. Sure. Um, I don't mean to do that on purpose, but anyway, it was a big deal. So I, I just, we all watched the same copy, too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which, which was kind of fun because it's like, oh, I'm watching my VHS with you guys. So it was kind of neat. Scan lines included. Complete with your weird fucking trailers at the end of the movie. The whole, everything, the fucking, the, the trailers for Party Animal at the end and everything. Oh, what a problematic trailer that was. <laughs> Yes, it is. <laughs> oh my god. That Confederate flag t-shirt fucking blew me away. That trailer was so full of like rape jokes and uh like toilet humor yeah. and just you know blatantly expressing the American flag and it's like it's a 3 minute montage of like the worst human ever and it's like a party animal. <laughs> BTW, the main character is a piece of shit. Check it out now by Charles Band. <laughs> You don't even need to see it. Like, you saw it already. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. You even got the whole, like, lightning uh, lightning uh, video intro and everything. Yes, that was cool. Yeah. But, yeah, on the shelf, uh, this movie is, like, I don't want to say the greatest hits of Empire Pictures, but it's kind of like a party mix of empire pictures which i like 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 uh like those savory snacks mix checks mixes it's got a little bit of everything and some taste better than others you know what i mean but you eat them all anyway because it's still all good stuff i really dig this movie a lot i'm gonna be revisiting it soon just because it's this it's it's a breeze to get through first of all and it, like richard mull's eating every piece of scenery that he can get his fucking mitts on and it's just really cool to see uh, a bunch of um directors in the same camp kind of get together and and just have have a good time and kind of do their little their little segments or whatever um it's super straightforward there's no bullshit it's just like yep uh i'm a genius uh and we're stuck uh playing games with satan here we go and that's it and it's a ton of fun f from beginning to end um and this and the fucking score f rips and i love it so yeah shelf without a doubt without a shadow of a doubt yeah i have to agree this is definitely a shelf movie um, even though it wasn't exactly what I thought I was getting into, I still enjoyed this quite a bit. Which is saying something, right? Yeah, you know what? It, it kind of pains me a little bit that this was just essentially, with the name change, a cash-in on Dungeons & Dragons, uh, you know, the popularity of it at the time, um, where, where you only have, like, again, like we said, like, maybe two scenes, maybe, like, two and a half. Like, I was going to say, and I forgot to bring it up, like, the scene with the ice cave, if you took all the historical uh, figures out of it, you know, that idea I could see in a, in a campaign. But, you know, still enjoyed this quite a bit. I like the idea of having all these different directors, and it kind of made me think of Body Melt in a sense where it was an anthology without actually being an anthology. Obviously, Body Melt is just one director, um, and this one, you know, like we talked about throughout the episode, is multiple, uh, but it just, it works. It doesn't feel disjointed at all. I mean, I guess you could get really technical here, like you can kind of tell uh, they were each filmed by somebody else, but they it works, generally speaking. And I'm just glad that we were able to uh, do a movie that, even if it wasn't necessarily about Dungeons and Dragons, at least it was uh, in that uh, hemisphere. Right. <laughs> hey, we're in the closet. We're looking at Baldwin. <laughs> And uh, we're, we're on the Baldwin shelf, you know, covered in garbage, flies, you know, are, are circling this thing at this point. It's been months uh, just cooking in my closet that has no air ventilation. I can smell it. Through my fucking speakers, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Through your speakers at home, I hope you're not smelling it because it's pretty rancid. Uh, you know, Bo Derek's foot has just kind of totally collapsed into nothing at this point. <laughs> um, I really should clean it up. But, uh, you know, I think this is uh, one of those ones where I'm where I'm twisting this the Baldwin statue's nipples and opening up that compartment in the middle that I stole from uh, Frankie from One Piece. Uh, but, you know, you know, just to kind of keep the D&D theme going... I think, you know, in the context of the Baldwin statue, these aren't like pepperoni slices. They are D20 
D20s. Maybe made out of pepperoni slices. Honestly, you know, get that big, uh, Damn. honking, uh, thing of pepperoni and you can cut it up, but someone just made a D20 out of each one. I would eat those die. <laughs> I, I would not, but, uh, have at it. They are covered in Daniel Baldwin sweat. Yeah, but you can suck on them fucking Daniel Baldwin nipples. Mmm, no, I'm good. Mmm. I, I, I don't want to suck on the statue's nipples or the real Baldwin's nipples. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, you you know that you know you twist the die, and uh, that chest uh, compartment opens up with that portal inside from John Hurt. The technology that I either stole or was given. I'm you know I haven't been totally clear on that. I'm sure I actually did say it in an episode, but I couldn't tell you which one. And uh, you know there's that vault in there, and it's not really organized because you know once I put the movie in there, I, you know I don't know where the fuck it goes. I know it's in there, and I can recall it at any time, just like a bag of holding. I just think about the item, and it shoots into my hand. But. Uh, <laughs> It's in there. I, I like this well enough. I, I won't say I love this movie, but there's parts of it that are really well done, and the overall connecting clue is good. I like it. It's it's probably a solid 3 out of 5 for me, so I, I'd probably revisit this, and hence why it goes in the Baldwin vault to be revisited. You know, what's, what's the next big D&D &D date? Uh, you know, not gonna hit another 2020, so I'll have to think on that a little. But the next time I wanna, <laughs> I wanna watch uh, a movie where Richard Mull basically fucks with some dude for an hour and 17 minutes, uh, this is the movie I'm gonna look for. Not ha- well, <laughs> it actually probably would be House, now that I say that. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely a shelf movie. No, oh, yeah, for sure, man. So, uh, what do we got, what do we got coming up on the schedule? Well, we kind of teased it, but our, our friend... Arlen Haro is coming back to the show, and this year he is not uh, being forced to suffer the piece of shit movie Green Lantern that we had him on for last year. No. Which I'm still recovering from. Arlen Haro of Los Harrow's podcast and the Phantom Zone podcast. Indeedy. Yes. We're doing the Wraith. Oh, yeah. There's going to be some returning people to, from the MDU. I, I already name dropped Clint Howard. There's uh, one major, uh, you know, the POS uh, in this film that I can't wait to just shit on for two or three hours. Well, we're gonna be we're gonna be welcoming Charlie. Charlie Sheen's coming into the MDU, baby. Uh, yeah, Tiger Blood, baby. Mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to that. Arlen has not spoiled anything for me, but he has said he is very happy to come on and do this instead of Green Lantern, and uh, I don't blame the guy. Oh yeah. And uh, beyond that. Uh, we got Trick or Trash. It's coming back, guys. Oh, yeah, it's coming up. Folks, uh, you know, we, we didn't forget about it. We got a lot of great stuff coming up for Trick or Trash for you guys. And as always, check that MD guide on that Instagram. It'll tell you exactly what's coming up. Yep. What episodes we got coming up, What if we have any interviews coming up, and um, special events and stuff. So definitely go go do that. Give us a follow. Give us a like on uh, Facebook or, and uh, follow us on Twitter, too. And Instagram. And YouTube. And Instagram. And YouTube. You know, again, <laughs> that fucking Munchie video. Check it out. Oh, yeah. The Nothing Matters. Check it out. You know, the Rodney Dangerfield triple Lindy through Mario Brothers. Check it. The <laughs> if you haven't seen these videos, what are you doing if you're listening to this show? <laughs> and if you're really hardcore... You can hop over to that Patreon we got. Yes. Now, if you follow us on Instagram, we've made it super easy for you to find this podcast. If you go to Instagram, there, there's a link in our bio, and that will give you a link to all your different podcast apps, whichever one of those you may have, to listen. And the top one there is the Patreon. Yep. You can sign up for our Patreon. You get a $2 tier. Uh, there's a $5 tier and a $10 tier. You can get some T-shirts, some stickers, uh, access to exclusive content, some good shit on there. So uh, if you dig the show, please, uh, supporting us that way would be huge. And, uh, you know, for no money at all, you hop onto that Apple podcast, leave us that five-star review. Yep. That'd be great, too. Deeply appreciate it every time. And everybody who does contribute and shares things and likes all our stuff and listens, thank you so much, as always. You make all of it worth it. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So we're, we're glad you're enjoying the content, and uh, we're, we're happy to, to, to keep giving you some good stuff. And we see it all. Oh, yeah. We usually like to comment uh, on it, whether on the show or in response. But if we if we don't, believe us, we, we see it. And if, and if you're really not sure screen shot it and uh, send us an email over at movie dumpster podcast at gmail.com and uh yeah like we did earlier we'll get back to you yeah we try to we try to get everybody but sometimes you know it just slips through so you know if we if you do if you didn't hear from us the first time ping us again because we definitely will get back to you for sure and uh speaking of patreon we always like to thank our patrons uh hunter davenport brendan lemune the autistic gamer 89 christopher jacob chavez Leonardo Roberto Talavera Barocio. Gorlami. <laughs> I have to ask before I move on. You do know that this man is not Italian, right? I know. He knows. <laughs> he knows I know. <laughs> okay. Okay. Just had to clarify that. 
Amanda Tweed, Joe Has a Mustache, Dustin Elkin, Nick Lowry, Dalton Bell, and Serge Murillo. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks, guys. So that's it. That's The Dungeon Master from 1984, directed by David Allen, Charles Band, John Carl Beekler, Peter Ford, Peter Manugian, Ted Nicolau, and Rosemary Turco. Hey, everybody, if you want some more bad movie goodness, you can check us out at moviedumpsterpodcast.com. Subscribe to us anywhere you listen to your podcast, and make sure to leave us a five-star review if you dig the show, because it helps us get out of the bottom of the dumpster and into more eardrums. Yeah, and if you're on the social medias, you can follow us at Movie Dumpster on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. I'm Joel Scola. I'm Sean O'Rourke. I'm Connor McGraw. Thanks for visiting the dumpster. That thing is only a culmination of future possibilities. In a future reality... I shall destroy you. I reject your reality and I substitute my own.